Okay, guys, uh, welcome back. Everybody survived Sunday. Uh, kayaking uh, people, are they uh, back? <laughs> yes, okay. How was the kayaking experience? Great, very good. Excellent. Uh, now you saw it from the maritime point of view, Brownick. Very good. Okay, now we continue with our summer school. Uh, and Lucas is here with us. He is the master of the energy module. Uh, so you will now learn how uh, energy is modeled uh, in William. Uh, Lucas, the floor is yours. Okay, maybe can we wait a couple of minutes? Because I some people. You think so? Okay. I have no recovery from the weekend. Ah, okay. <laughs> so Lucas, uh, let's wait for it. Maybe. I know many of you, but not all. But I will start with introducing myself. Yeah, you can introduce yeah. yourself, or maybe someone can introduce themselves. Yeah, those that I don't know, I'm really interested. So, uh, my name is Lucas Egler. Uh, I am working in the Austrian Energy Agency. I have been involved in the, uh, in the project predecessor of the promotion, which was Medeas, and I'm Really happy uh, to be involved here as well and uh, responsible for the energy module. Um, yeah, I'm working in the area of energy systems modeling since more or less uh, the start of my career, like eight years ago. And uh, sometimes more on the small scale <coughs> when support supporting companies in energy performance indicators and this sort of stuff, simple uh, statistical models or uh, this is, this is probably the most complex model that we have. We also run optimization models in the Austrian Energy Agency. So everything related to numbers and energy consumptions, that's our domain, I would say. Um, not sure, I think people also don't know you because you just arrived yes. yesterday. Maybe you can also okay. introduce already now. I am Ignacio Blas, but you can call me Nacho. I am from the University of Valladolid, I, as with Javier, Gonzalo, Paola. And I've been working in locomotion uh, since, the start, since the start of the project. And I, I was working also in the Medeas project. Uh, I usually work in the technical coordination of, of locomotion, of the, of, the, of the William project. As you know, there are different modules, different modelers, and my work is try to integrate, try to match the work that everyone do in his branch, in his model, in his, in his modules, into the into the Boolean model. But I also work, maybe as no as less than I, I would I would like in the energy model. And I work in the end use model and at the when, when Lucas finished the present the introduction, I will to present the the induced so much of model in the And I don't know mm -hmm. so uh, indeed let me tell you that uh, Nacho is the only one that knows how all William works. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only one. No. So what you have any doubt about how it's integrated that how the things work, is he's really the the person you, you should ask. <laughs> there are a lot of things, William, that I don't have. It's so weird, and there are things that definitely I, I, I don't have. Do you have some doubt? Absolutely, I can. I will try to understand it. Uh, really. mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, in Medeas, I understand you, you've been more or less developing the whole energy model of Medeas. Mm -hmm. well, 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 we well, need well, a lot of things in Medeas. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's changed a lot, and um, this is part of learning in system dynamics. I think you improve your understanding of systems all the time. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Gonzalo, whom you already know. Well, so, yeah, you know, he doesn't need to introduce himself, but he will, I guess, right? Because you've been here the whole week. Yeah, so, well, just uh, as you know, well, my name is Gonzalo, I came from the University of Valladolid as well. I will introduce a little bit uh, a topic uh, already we already discussed in the day two, the, how the variability of the model uh, is matched in, in the model. Uh, yeah. I'm involved also in another part of the model, the demographic one, but this is another one. Okay. Yeah, all right. Those people are coming. <laughs> we didn't really start it, we started with the introduction. Uh, uh, the introduction only not to lose time because today I'm not sure how the timing will work out, but it's certainly going to be a full day. So, uh, um, as with regard to you, please, like, I don't know, I guess we will get to know each other during the day, right? So, I, I don't want to. Make a full round here, or we will take as much time. All right, then uh, let's start. You know, project uh, the schedule today, and what we're planning is uh, just I will run you through like some basics when it's about because I understand your backgrounds are very different from economics, engineering, uh, energy, so. We will start with some basics about energy statistics and we will go into quite some detail of energy balances. Like something that I would have wished I would have learned in university, like uh, help me. Um, and uh, then we will continue with, uh, I will try to explain to you how the living energy module works and the different sub-modules with support of Gonzalo and Nat. And in the afternoon, we're going to have a hands-on session, which uh, hopefully will continue with, uh, uh, with the story from Terry Tayland. Uh, so uh, Uli is kind of preparing something there. And so some venting modeling, because I understood that a lot of you really like the hands-on experience in Benson. So the idea is that we continue in this direction. Alright, if you have any questions, just you know, just talk actually. <laughs> it's, it's, we can uh, directly, you know, just if, you, if it's about something, just put it out there. So why are we doing this, actually? Uh, well, we are facing a really multi-dimensional crisis. I'm sure like you have heard this over the last couple of days uh, often enough. Uh, but if I, I did the work and I was kind of collecting some, some data on what happened in my lifetime, the, life, the world today, it's not the same like it was in, when I was born. It's just let me run you through some of the observations. Uh, like when start with the positive things. Like when I was born, the average life expectancy at birth was nine years lower than today. So a child being born today will on average live nine years long. It's amazing. Uh, GDP, obviously. A lot of people were, uh, could escape poverty during that time. And uh, so the minimum material demands are fulfilled. It's, uh, it's amazing. But obviously, uh, there's also some developments that are not so beneficial. Like when you look here at the, at the uh, extraction of iron ore, which in the 2000s kind of really picked up, so that quadrupled like times four since, since I was born. I was born in 84, by the way. <laughs> so uh, sand and gravel. Sand and gravel uh, production, which is necessary for concrete, also times four. If you look at CO2, uh, the annual CO2 emissions, 
times uh, almost doubled. If you look at the trade uh, since the 70s, it's almost times four. So the global trade, there's four times as many ships uh, going over the ocean. On CO2 we already had. And um, temperature increase since uh, 1970, it has been already one degree uh, on the average global temperature increase. And so since 84, I was just guessing probably 0 0.7. Um, so this is just what we have observed now already. And we all have, you know, know the experience of, of each summer becoming hotter. Um, and some tipping points, we are rapidly advancing on some tipping points, like the, uh, the Arctic sea ice minimum, uh, like the, uh, the square kilometers of sea ice coverage in, in, in autumn. Um, the average has, has reduced by 13% per decade. Um, we'll soon, we'll probably be gone soon. I don't know. I'm not an expert in this field, but this is just, you know, big. So all together we have like huge changes and this is and, and all of them are interlinked and this is obviously the domain of integrated assessment models. And this is uh, this is why we're here. So why is energy especially re relevant in, in this context? Because obviously you see here the global emissions by sector and the yellow sector is the energy are the emissions from the energy sector. Agriculture, orange is industrial processes. This chunk is energy. And if you look, uh, this is uh, exactly also in the energy here, you can also see where it's used, like how much it's from transport, how much it's in buildings, industry. But in total, three quarters of the emissions are from energy. So it's important to have a good idea of what's going on in the energy system. Um, because it's, it's one of the central elements of, of any integrated assessment model. And there's huge changes. I understand that you talked a lot about the concepts. Like, uh, this is the change. Uh, since 1990, I think, yeah. So this is gross domestic product, starting from 1990, and this is the uh, CO2 emissions. So the gross domestic product has been growing on world average faster than the CO2 emissions. But if you look, for example, on some countries, you can actually observe decoupling. Like this is Germany, GDP was rising, while the CO2 emissions were decreasing on an absolute level. So this kind of gives hope, I would say, for future situations. Maybe not something else that, that, that will give hope is this chart that shows the, um, the price developments of generation capacities. Like, uh, and most striking here certainly is uh, the development of, of, of PV uh, in the beginning. But it's really a bad check in quality. It's 2010. Uh, the price for solar PV installations was $340 per megawatt hour. Now we have 68 rapid decrease. If you look at onshore wind power, offshore wind power, also the more power is installed, note that it's a logarithmic scale here. So this is how much power is the cumulative installed capacity, and this is the, the, uh, the cost. And, and um, yeah, you know, the rapid decay. And, and what's also interesting is that for some technologies like nuclear, actually price has increased with you know higher security standards. And for others, like for coal, it has stayed more or less constant. But for the renewables, we're still on the you know having a huge downward trend. And if you look at the uh, 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 Lithium ion uh, cells, the price is here. That's also a crazy development, like from 
more than six thousand dollars per kilowatt hour to two hundred forty-four uh, dollars per kilowatt hour from ninety-two to two thousand sixteen. Nineteen ninety-two to two thousand sixteen, so in twenty years. So, um, and this obviously affects the energy system how it is uh, how it is operated. And so this is why we uh, why we should put some focus on, on the energy module. Uh, of uh, what makes it especially complicated in general? I would say uh, in the power system in general, demand must always match supply. You know, instantly, if you put on a, in electricity, if you put on a hair dryer here, then somewhere else there needs to be a little extra generation to account for this. Um, the system uncertainties uh, in the energy system, I think one interesting aspect is that the energy system is often faced with unprecedented changes. So uh, there is no empirical data on the energy transition because there was no energy transition before us. Um, innovation can really change how things work together. Um, government policies uh, change the behavior of the system again. So um, it makes it more difficult, obviously. We have uh, nonlinear relationships between system variables. Uh, we have time delays. Uh, and we have complex system uh, feedback structures. This, this, is, this is exactly the domain of integrated assessment. So with this primer, Actually, uh, I would, uh, or with this teaser, I would, I would, I would go to uh, to energy balances, um, or like talk a little about the energy conversion chain, just to make sure that we are all on the same state and on the same level. Uh, because if you have to model something, you need to measure it first, you need to operationalize whatever you're modeling there. And uh, in, in, in for William, or in energy models, I would say in general, often energy balances are the, the main source of the data. So uh, but let's talk first about the energy conversion in general. So what you see here, we start from the top. Uh, and in the top, we have the primary energy. This is already kind of, I'm already introducing the terms that we will find later. Primary energy, so it's coal being mined, it's, uh, uh, it's crude oil being, uh, being pumped from the ground, or gas, but it could also be primary electricity, like uh, wind power or hydro. So you have primary energy, and uh, and, uh, and this primary energy goes into a transformation, like into a power plant. So, um, so for example, the coal is used to produce electricity. So the, the coal is changing. I mean, now that in, and, and this is obviously creating some transformation losses. So, Strictly speaking, there's no losses in, you know, thermodynamically. There's no energy cannot be lost or created. It can only be changed in, 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 in form. So, uh, but in balances, actually, you, you're talking about losses, which is not very precise, but I think it's very practical. Um, what is important is also that, uh, that for, for mining these resources, for example, you also require energy. So this is the so-called sec energy sector own consumption. So you need uh, energy to mine the resources or to uh, to pump out the, the crude oil. And um, yeah, we will come. Actually, maybe we will come to that uh, in the example later in the afternoon. Also, where you can try it. So we have primary energy and we have uh, transformation and we have transformation input and trans uh, so something that goes into the transformation we have something that gets out of the comes out of the transformation usually heat and uh, and uh, electricity and uh, some losses like 
temperature, uh, uh, thermal energy losses on the temperature level where we cannot utilize it. And then we have, sorry, we have, uh, then we have, then we distribute this to the end consumer and we get final energy. So final energy is really the form of energy that is utilized by the consumer. So it's what's, what's uh, metered by the electricity meter. It's when you, when you go to the gas station and you fill up your tank, then this is also considered final energy. Then, uh, but this is obviously not, not what really delivers the service that you want, because if you, um, if you fill up the tank of your car, what you actually want is mobility. You want to get from one place to the other. So uh, there's, even, uh, there's use for energy. So in the, case, in the case of the car, that would be traction energy, energy that is available to the wheels um, to transport you from one place to another. So it is the useful energy. In the case of, uh, let's say, district heat, what you actually want is you want your house to be warm. So it's the warm, it's the temperature delivered by these radiators uh, that is actually the, the useful energy that you can harvest. Uh, that, that, that is actually delivering the service that you need. Uh, for example, if you put on the light, you know, you, you don't want electricity to see, you want, uh, you want the room to be bright. So, um, or if on the air condition, for example, if you want, uh, this is the useful energy level. However, the, the useful energy or energy balances in, in general, well, um, they don't go down to the level of useful energy. They stop here, final energy. And this is just one sentence. I mean, um, what is also important that, that, that these energy balances, they are a consistent framework, so there's guidelines how to, how to survey this data and the stati national statistical offices in all countries of the world. Um, they are, uh, they are uh, collecting this data and publishing it, and you can be more or less uh, trustful that this, this will be uh, comparable and, and consistent. You know. So, as I already said, energy balances are based on national uh, uh, surveys. So, nation state is the unit, and they're usually annual. And 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 when a statistical office uh, collects this data, they are actually collecting the physical quantities, like kilograms of coal or liters of crude oil, and they will or barrels of crude oil, and they will then translate it into the energy content content. Uh, to make it comparable, because else you cannot, it's difficult to compare one kilogram of coal with two kilowatt hours of electricity. So, to make it comparable, you need to convert it to the same unit with heating values. So, and once you have it comparable, it really allows you to gain insights uh, into how the energy is actually used in our society. So, what is the total? energy use? What is the fuel mix of a society? Maybe it varies across countries. Um, you can uh, calculate efficiencies and, and losses from that. You can calculate how efficient the society deals with uh, energy. Um, and for all more or less scenario analysis, it's a really fundamental data source. Um, it allows us to, to monitor developments, ongoing developments and changes in our energy system. Like, for example, now with uh, electrification of the vehicle fleet, uh, with electric mobility, uh, you can already see this in, in, the, uh, in the energy balances that this increases the electricity share in, in mobility, for example. Um, and then we can quantify and monitor these developments. Mm. And these energies, they always constitute of a matrix of uh, energy commodities, which are fuels, but electricity is not a fuel, so we call it energy commodity, um, and energy flows. So you have this matrix of fuels in the columns and flows in the lines. You will see that later. Um, 
what is uh, an energy commodity? Well, with energy commodity, we separate between primary and energy, primary and secondary energy commodities, roughly. So, primary is uh, energy commodities that are extracted or captured directly from natural resources. So, crude oil, natural gas, um, coal, exactly. Uh, and secondary energy, and this is this figure, and also actually the, 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 the quotes. They are directly from the from the International Energy Agency's um, statistical manual. Um, the uh, secondary energy commodities are all energy commodities which are produced from primary commodities. So uh, this their transformation outputs. Anyway. So uh, and then there is. More, uh, there's also the, you can also distinguish between renewable and non renewable, um, primary and secondary. And then what you see here also is, is uh, combustible. So um, here we have, for example, the non renewables. And out of them, you can uh, you have uh, coal, crude oil, uh, natural gas, liquids. Uh, natural gas, uh, shale oil, they are kind of primary energy commodities and they are combustible. Uh, and then secondary you have petroleum products, so diesel and benzene, which is produced from crude oil in refineries uh, and you get uh, secondary combustible energy, non-renewable energy commodities. Um, heat, obviously, is heat and electricity uh, they're, they're usually secondary uh, energy commodities because in, in, in conventional power plants you produce heat and electricity from other fuel sources. Um, but there is also primary heat and, uh, uh, and electricity. What, what could this be? It's primary and it's heat, so it's directly the primary source. Geothermal? Geothermal, yes. Solar thermal also. Solar thermal, that would be heat. And in electricity, it would be uh, actually PV, wind, the, the renewable electricity sources. Yeah. So this is the, the main commodities, and the commodities in the energy balances, state, you will find them in the columns. You will see that. Then you have the flows, and uh, the flows uh, the flows should should tell you at which point in the energy system actually the, the quantity is measured. So uh, this is a, a small model of how the en how energy balance data is uh, measured. And you see at the top it starts with indigenous production, so this means national production, like coal which is dug from the ground. So that is obviously uh, the uh, 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 primary energy commodity and a uh, country can mine coal, but it can also import coal or export coal or, uh, or it can draw from stocks if there is uh, for example, there is the, the oil reserve, strategic oil reserves, and you can either draw from the stocks in some years, and in some time, in some years, you might take these stocks. Uh, so you can do this for primary commodities. And then these primary commodities, they can either be uh, used directly as, as final, uh, go directly to final use, because as we said earlier, there is final electricity, for example, that could be used directly. Um, but you could also, also natural gas is a good example that's not really changed. Uh, it's directly going to the end consumer without transformation in between if it's consumed as gas. It produces secondary energy commodity power plant, and uh, in the power plant, you produce electricity. Or in a combined heat and power plant, you produce electricity and heat, district heat for selling. And uh, here also we have trade 
so you cannot only trade primary fuels, but also uh, primary uh, secondary fuels. Like electricity is traded within Europe, um, and uh, and then other secondary fuels, diesel, benzene, for example, they are also traded. And then they go to fine use, and this is important. Like fine use, this is this is the end of 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 uh, of what you can see in the energy balance. As I said, we don't go to the actual um, useful energy level. So this is important because these are also kind of the main elements that we will need to model in William. So if you want to make an adequate representation of the, of the national energy systems, then these are the main flows that we need to model. So let's jump into it, like really into an energy balance. So what you here, see here is a, an example balance sheet. It's the quality is really bad, but I will zoom in later anyway. So uh, important thing is here you have a matrix. This is for one year and one country, and uh, you have a matrix that consists of the energy commodities, the fuels in the columns, and the energy flows in the lines. And, uh, and you can think of this uh, as, as consisting of maybe three blocks. You have uh, energy supply. So this is, this is uh, production, import, export. This is this part here, energy supply. So where does my primary energy come from? Then you have uh, the transformation sector. So uh, in the balance, you would, you would have uh, which type of power plant produces, you know, utilizes how much of which commodity and produces how much of which commodity. And then you So um, uh, if I jump, if I go into detail, like the first block, as I said, now you should be able to read it. This is uh, this is energy supply here, and if you read closely, you can see that it's uh, right on the top. Can you read it in the back? Yeah. Should I try to make it bigger? Uh, anyway, I will read it to you. Yeah. Production, that's national production, international aviation bunkers. This is a kind of interesting concept because, because we have these national boundaries in, in, in this bookkeeping system. Um, there's some energy consumption that happens outside of any nation. And this is on international waters for, for ships and, uh, and in, in international airspace, so uh, uh, in airplanes, actually, because that's not accounting to accounted to any nation but it's accounted separately and reported so anyway so if you have uh, here for example you have natural gas production 26,000 units and imports another 25,000 units so you could immediately say that half of the natural gas is imported in this country um, and because you have the same unit everywhere, so all these units are in tevatrol or megatons oil equivalent, it depends a little bit, but they're uh, exchangeable. Um, uh, because they are comparable, you know, you can just make the total sum. And, and this here, the total primary energy supply, is really one of the most important uh, uh, flows in energy balances because it tells you how much primary energy is there in, in, in my country. Here you go. So this is the, the supply block. Okay. Then, uh, then below the supply block, the supply and is the transformation block. So all these flows here, you will, if you look closely, you will see that there's negative numbers and there's also positive numbers. 
like electricity, for example, is positive or this, there is no district heat in this uh, example. There would be district heat if you can read it here. Um, negative numbers means in the in the EAR energy balances, negative numbers are transformation inputs. Uh, so something that goes into a transformation process, like for example, uh, for example, um, you have the process of electricity plants, and all these uh, in, uh, negative numbers here, these are these are fuels that go into an electricity plant, and here this positive number, this is. Um, this is the electricity produced from this. So now the question, how can you calculate the losses of such an electricity process? Yeah, you sum it up. Right. Uh, it's, and uh, actually, this is what is done in the total column. You can't read it here because this window is there. But here, it would say total. So this is just the sum. And uh, you have different transformation processes. So you have electricity plants, you have CHP plants. Uh, CHP stands for combined heat and power. So it's plants that produce not only electricity, but also district heat. Obviously, this is more important in some countries than in others. In warmer um, plants. That only produce district heat. Uh, then there is other transformation processes, blast furnaces, which is uh, I'm not sure. This is this is this is a process that is uh, in the iron and steel industry, where you have uh, where you produce steel and you take in coal and you produce. Uh, Produce uh, manufactured gases. Actually, you can you can check it out here. It takes coal. Uh, so we do at least know it takes coal. Um, yeah. You have gas works. Uh, you have where gas is being processed. You have coal patent fuel. Uh, this is this is this is some. Um, um, Patent fuel. I mean, this is, for example, a, a process where you produce, I think, liquid fuels from solid, from from uh, coal. You have oil refineries. This is important because you they utilize crude oil and produce oil products, so diesel and um, um, benzene, for example. Uh, petrochemical plants. They are also important because they also utilize a lot of uh, Fossil fuels for non-energy purposes. Come to it later. Uh, liquefaction plants. This is now actually the coal liquefaction. In this country, there is obviously no coal liquefaction. Um, but I think the Baltic countries, for example, have a significant share of uh, coal liquefaction in their energy mix. Um, yeah, and other transformations. And then you have two interesting lines, uh, which are kind of different from the rest. This is energy industry own use. So this is the energy that is consumed by the energy sector to provide this energy. So um, this includes, uh, for example, energy consumption for, for pumped hydro storages, for uh, all, all sorts of storage losses actually, but also the energy consumption of refineries, of mining facilities if for coal, of, uh, of, of oil, well, oil wells. This is all accounted to the energy sector on consumption. This is uh, a variable, I think you already heard in Ole's uh, lecture, that, that it's uh, actually endogenous, for example, in the William model. Because it's interesting because the, for mining, for example, the more you mine something, uh, the more the energy requirements or the energy intensity will increase because the ore grade will become worse, then you need more energy input to mine in the materials. And then you have losses, which is grid losses. So here you can see for example, 
electricity grid losses. So we have a total final consumption of 103,000 units and 23,000 units of grid losses, so 5% for example. Here you go. If you have any question, let me know. We'll come to consumption. TFC stands for total final consumption. The uh, final consumption is split up into different sectors like industry, transport, uh, uh, others. Yeah. The others include residential uh, services, agriculture, fishing. And this is actually what Nacho will later show how we model exactly this consumption. And then, uh, important, there's also non energy use. Um, there's, there's an own category. You see that there's, for example, a significant quantity of um, oil products used for non energetic purposes. And probably there's also some natural gas. It depends always on the company, but gas, for example, is used for fertilizers also. So this would be accounted for as non energy use. And plastics in the chemical industry, for example, if you produce plastics from, from oil products, yeah, please. What, what's the meaning of feedstock? Feedstock is, uh, of which feedstocks, I think this is for refineries. Uh, so feedstock usually refers to, uh, to refineries. Yeah, here it says that no, total non energy use is, for example, 31,000 units. and Half of it is for feedstocks, which is um, refineries. Actually, that's a good question. It's, uh, it's not so clear. But in, in extended energy balances, uh, there's much more detail, actually. They go also here. You can kind of pinpoint it down to the individual industry sector. Um, I wouldn't find these always online. Can anyone get the extended energy balances somewhere? From from EAR, actually you have to pay for them, mm -hmm. but usually on, on university libraries you should have access uh, via university libraries. You usually should have access to them. Um, but, uh, but for example, Eurostat energy balances uh, are publicly available. So for the EU countries, you can download them. They are very similar. They are a little bit different. In, the, in, in, in some aspects, like for example, the transformation, this is probably the most notable difference in transformation in ER energy balances, you only have one block and it's the numbers are either negative or positive, negative if it's a transformation input and positive if it's a transformation output. And in the Eurostat energy balances, you would have one block transformation input with positive numbers and one block transformation output with positive numbers. But in fact, it's it's the same. It's converted. Um, and this is uh, you can if you're more this is kind of a graphic type of thinker, then you can you can instead of having all these ugly long complicated tables, you can also um, you can also show these tables in a energy flow diagram or uh, Sankey diagram, how they are also called. There's a great tool from the Eurostat uh, for energy balances. We, we will do a short exercise briefly. I have to look at the time, but I will. Yeah. Okay, end of energy balances. I should. I'm out of time. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think we, we make five or ten minutes so that you guys can look into it. So. Um, uh, what you see here is you can follow the colors are the different fuels like gas, oil products, whatever, and the nodes here are the different steps or the different flows in an energy balance. So here you have imports, you have national production, then here you have the transformation sector, and this is direct carryover, so primary energy fuels that are consumed directly, and uh, here you have available. After transformation, so this would be equivalent to transformation output, and here you would have final consumption, and you have uh, you have uh, 
losses and sector energy on consumption. Um, is it already? So the idea would be now to have uh, maybe 10 minutes, nonetheless. I think let's do this. Let's go 10 minutes. If you go on this link or you just Google uh, Eurostat Senke, Senke, uh, or you follow this link, you can uh, you can get this this visual diagram. So you can select a country, and uh, uh, then you could you could select your country. Although I understand not everybody is from Europe here, <laughs> so uh, uh, where are you from? China. Okay, I'm not aware if there's a <laughs> Chinese. Uh, Thank you, Dai. Chronic again? They also have a similar yeah, thing? Yeah, Netherlands would be uh, used as an example. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe you can you can pick the country of your interest. You can also, someone can pick Croatia, maybe. And uh, yeah, try to try to answer at least like this, uh, these countries. And you can discuss with your neighbor. Um, so, what is the most important primary energy source of your country? Uh, what are the major electricity production sources in your country? Because this all varies. Um, who is which is the largest uh, consumer of final energy in your country? And uh, this is the this is the bonus. You can calculate the biofuel share in your country. You could. Uh, um, you could calculate what's the, the loss factor of, uh, of, of um, distribution losses. Um, you can calculate uh, oh, this is double okay. right. You can also calculate uh, a power plant efficiencies. And uh, yeah, maybe of currently that's important what's the input share of natural gas, for example. So, I will show you how to get to this. Okay, so if you follow the link, you can click here. Um, if you open it the first time, you can also follow this tutorial, or I can run you through also. So on the left, you can select your country. And if you at the at the legend, if you click on the legend and you show full details, you will see the individual fuels also on the bottom edge of the legend. So this way you see full fuels. And you can uh, you can further expand the notes to get, for example, more details on, on, on final energy consumption or whatever. You can also click on every note, and then you can you can you can also kind of drag and drop around, like if you're interested in if you're interested in final energy consumption, you can also, for example, click on this note. And, and for example, show a pie chart, see where it's coming from. 
Okay, I would say maybe just five minutes because we're not so <laughs> already uh, out of time. This is certainly something that is really advisable for getting up the corners of the advice. Thank you, John. All products. <coughs>
of creating tests on Someone observed uh, that uh, that um, I think the question for renewables, for example. So, what is primary wind, for example? And why is the transformation output the same as the transformation inputs? So, for you want to say something? I'm thinking of like 15th century wind. <laughs> no, the, the thing is for, for usually for, for coal, for example, you account for primary energy and then, and then you have a, a, a conversion and, and, and losses. For, for theoretically, if there's something like primary wind, like what you would like to measure is the kinetic energy of the wind that is sweeping the turbine area. That is what you would like to measure. Obviously, that's really difficult. And for solar PV, for example, what you would like to measure is like the real primary thing would be the, the irradiation on the solar panel, but you can't measure that. So by definition, and this is an important kind of bookkeeping rule of energy balances, uh, they, are, they only measure the output of these renewable sources and they assume an efficiency of one. So this is, uh, this is because this can really give you a headache. What is the efficiency in all other power plants? But 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 for example, uh, wind and PV have an efficiency of one. How can that be? Anyway, <clears throat> I encourage you to uh, to to look at this source when when you are uh, I don't know when you want to get a, an overview of a country's energy system, and you can play around. I was just talk, talking to Nacho, even after years of, uh, of working with energy balances, it can happen to you that somewhere in one field you will find a number and you ask yourself, okay, what is now really the physical representation of this number and how, how can it be? So it, it's, uh, it's tricky in detail, but I encourage you to, to like really um, go through this. I think it's really enlightening and shows you the path of, of uh, energy to the system and this tool is really nice. Hydrogen is around 2% of final energy uh, use, but it's not a big uh, uh, um, The disaggregation of fossil fuels is, is way larger, of fossil commodities is way larger than of renewables. And hydrogen is missing altogether. Uh, so, um, so currently, I would say the, the energetic utilization of hydrogen is very small. So, so it's statistically yeah. not relevant. It's more the non-energetic. Two percent of the final energy demand. It's huge. But, but it's non-energetic purposes. It's, it's mostly energy. right. It's mostly for for uh, fertilizers and for the chemical industry. So. Um, it's represented as natural gas. You see it in the balance as yeah. part of natural gas. It's, it would be visible in the sec in the um, in the energy consumption of the chemical industry, in the fine energy consumption of natural gas in the chemical industry. There it would be represented, yeah, as in the non-energetic 
final energy consumption of four. Yeah. All right. Um, but with this, I would actually like to start, or else we will run into trouble later. Uh, I would, I would like to start with the. If that's okay with you, uh, I would like to start with the green energy. Yeah. If you have any questions, like with regard to this, you can always address me in breaks or wherever. But for now, um, let's start with the uh, with the energy module. Yeah. So um, there's some. I found this. I found this in. I found the classification of energy models paper somewhere, and I think it was quite suitable. Just to give you an idea of, of what William does, um, there is what's, like, you can characterize energy models by these different and probably more, more uh, categorizations. And uh, for, for William, we have, there's, you know, it depends if you, have, uh, if you have a specific energy demand or supply model, like an integrated approach here, where we do have an integrated. I will run through this quickly to save time for the for the rest. Uh, we have um, a mixed bottom-up and top-down approach. We have uh, as underlying uh, uh, methodology a macroeconomic simulation model, like input-output. You already heard. We have a system dynamics approach. We have a we have an interregional model. We cover um, the overall economy, no, no, not only one sector. And um, the time horizon is long term of our model. We don't focus on the small details, but on the broad development. And our data requirements are high because it's a point with this uh, disaggregated model. Uh, when we were designing the energy module, uh, our uh, basic principles that we had in mind was to be energy balance consistent because this is what stakeholders know. They do know, well, some of them know how to read energy balances and they want to find themselves in this concept. You know, so the, the main, so the terminology and the consistency, consistency is important. Uh, and then we had to decide on the technologies that we want to represent, and there our idea was that we wanted to include all technologies that are likely to play an important role in future energy systems. So this includes renewables, obviously, uh, storage uh, in different kinds, carbon capture and storage, demand side management, hydrogen, yeah. and we have biophysical limitations. Um, so, what you see here, I will spend some time on this chart, is an overview of the energy module. So, if you just focus on the red arrows, this is the main input <coughs> and output to the module. Because, you know, William is a monster, I would say, and the energy module is just, you know, a small part of it. Uh, and so, what is important to me is that all the, the interface variables are defined, and so our main Input is the economic demand of how good, how much energy is uh, demanded by the economy, um, and then the main outputs are the primary energy demand that is required to fulfill this economic demand, and the emissions that are uh, that are uh, created in the process. So this is the main outputs, and then we do have uh, investment required to make this. Uh, Fulfill this uh, this energy demand. We have uh, material and land use requirements, and so um, okay. So for uh, if we start here with the energy end use, this is the sub module uh, where U.S. dollars, so economic demand, is translated into kilowatt hours. Not sure we go into detail there, so. We have a, we have I think, 63 sectors in, in, in William, and for each of them we have an economic demand, and then we have uh, somehow we sum it all up. There is an energy demand for different fuel commodities. So we have this final demand that's the main output, and this final energy demand goes into the energy transformation model. 
So within the energy transformation module, we model the whole energy transformation chain, like I showed you before, from primary energy to final energy. Um, and uh, we model it in great disaggregation with different uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, what is important also, once you have a, a certain power plant stock, you also need to allocate which power plants of the available power plants are actually utilized which is this technology utilization allocation here. Um, and in order to adequately have this transformation module, you also need to account for the energy capacities. That is important. So you have a stock of power plants of different types and uh, some capacities that are being decommissioned and some, some that are being built anew. And somehow the model also has to decide uh, which technology is built. So if you have a lack of, let's say, electricity production uh, capacity, which type of power plant will build. And uh, then we do have the energy variability management module, which is uh, where Gonzalo will spend some time with after the break, um, where it's about, uh, you know, we're, we're changing, and I think you're already on day two, you spend a great uh, you, you, you covered the topic in detail that uh, introducing a, a large amount of intermittent uh, power production has some, some requires some changes in the energy, energy system. All right. Um, yeah, and the, well, the most I would say, I'm not sure if you already went into detail there, probably also with Ole. If I look outside, in, in the bigger picture, now I'm just taking the economy module, the energy module, and the materials module here, and then be aware that there's other modules as well in William, like the land use, the climate, the society, and the demography, and there's also link, links or feedbacks to, to the other modules, but I just want to point out two of the main feedback chains that we have. Very interesting. One is this uh, energy materials economy feedback, where uh, we get this final, well, an economic demand that is translated into final energy demand, the given price from the economy module. Um, the energy module calculates uh, the primary energy demand that's resulting from this final energy demand. And uh, so, so sorry. What I what I mean is, so that I know the, our, our industries and companies and firms need 100 units of of electricity, and to fulfill this, I need 200 units of coal. Let's say. So this is the primary energy demand that is sent to materials, and uh, the materials module will uh, actually calculate. Um, uh, the materials module one knows the reserves of these materials so that we cover in the module, and it will calculate a given, it models the market dynamics, it will calculate a given price. This is what you did in the, in the gold coin example. And, um, and there, is, uh, there, there is, if the supply doesn't match the demand, we have to little, we will increase the price until the supply can match the demand. And if the price is incre increased, then the, then the demand is reduced. So um, there is less uh, energy increase. But does this happen instantly or do you have iterations mm -hmm. over a time period? <laughs> and that's actually a really interesting question because uh, originally we thought that we, William is a system dynamics model. So in general, it's a simulation and there's no simultaneous equations in, in, in simulations. But there would have been one option, and we explored this, but we managed to do without this in the end. In the end, we managed to do all uh, uh, most that probably better because they were constructing this feedback loop. In the end, the price function was sufficient to uh, avoid the simultaneous equations and stay, stay within the simulation methodology, right? Yeah, uh, you increased, like, so 
But the definitely would reach like a certain more amount uh, in the price and the business of the high demand price function to go up. And over like the reduction time of the delays, um, we would like decrease the demand a lot. So we don't get into this kind of situation where we have this sort of situation. But it's a simplification of this. Ultimately, we would be opposed to do like multiple iterations until you find uh, the perfect version. That's not mm -hmm. We also have to be this case. Yeah, exactly. This is what I, I, I don't know if it would be the perfect way. Actually, like the, the system dynamic person in me tells me that it's more realistic to, to stay consistent with the, these dynamics because in optimization models, optimization models usually don't reflect reality because there is never the, the, the optimum uh, situation in markets. It's, there is no general equilibrium in markets. So, uh, so, so this, but this is kind of more the theoretical uh, debate going on about uh, simulation versus optimization. We also had this discussion strongly within the consortium when we we're talking about William. Um, but uh, we figured out a way how to kind of. So, so it's actually not true right now. The way it's implemented, it's not an iterative loop that happens at the same time step, but it's solved for it via the price function. But the general effect is the same. The demand, the next time step, is reduced um, in case uh, the supply uh, is, is too small to put in. So this is one really important feedback, um, because it affects the whole economy, obviously, and also the energy demand, and also the materials and the materials available. And then another innovative element of, uh, of, of, of William is um, that we actually have an, um, I'm not sure, but you already had in Inyaki, I think, last week, in the economic module. So, uh, so you know that in the course, the economic module, there's an input output module where you have this matrix where, uh, where, the, where you have all the sectors, the economic sectors, and over the input output matrix, you can say how much this sector has input from each other sector. So, how much the car industry needs input from, let's say, the, the, the basic metals industry in terms of dollars. And this sort of, usually this, this relation between the sectors in, in normal input-output models is fixed. So we have, it's, it's empiric, basically, based on, on beta and countries, and then you fix it, you freeze it, and then you, then you extrapolate into the future. So one of the really interesting features in William is that we try to make this dynamic. So, um, for example, in the we have a very high disaggregation in the energy sector. So there's an own sector for energy production from wind, energy production from PV, energy production from coal, for example. And uh, what we want to see is that what we want to represent is that you know the energy production from coal requires different inputs from other industry sectors than energy production from PV or wind. So, um, so ideally, what we will see is as the fossil sectors decline, they will become smaller, the output will become smaller. At the same time, the, the, the output of the other new technologies will become bigger and more important. And for example, if the PV sector, sector, which is, uh, I don't know, in China, for example, so this sort of dynamic is really important and this is uh, included in the model. Yes, and with this, uh, I, would, I would give uh, the floor to Nacho, who will uh, show you. Okay. Then I, I want to start to explain or try to explain how the end use of module is developed in William model. This is the diagram of the overview of the energy model. I think it's not the old, it's, this diagram is an older version that Lucas, that Lucas saw, but in the energy model we have different sub of models. The end use of module, the transformations of module, the capacities of module, 
are also the intelligence and the storage server. Then we are going to start with the first one. The first one is the energy and user model. And the aim of this model, as Lucas said, is convert the economic demand, the red arrow that is in monetary terms, into the final energy demands, that is the uh, blue arrow that is in energy terms. Then we have to convert the dollars or euros in uh, terajoules or tera or kilowatts or something the hour or something like that. This is the objective of this sort model. The, say the, the final objective of this sort model is the estimation, the estimation of the final energy. And a the correct estimation of the future energy demand is a key factor for the development of effective alternative policies. If we don't have a robust energy, final energy demand, we can yes, we can analyze, we can analyze policies as substitution of one type of energy for other or, or similar. Then it is very important this estimation. And also, as you can imagine, is one of the most difficult parts of the energy of the of the complex model. The, the estimation of the energy, the final energy demand is very complex and is subject to high, uh, very high uncertainties because it depends on a lot of factors. For example, it depends on the technology, uh, technological evolution, the energy demand depends on the social cultural behavior, of energy affordability, or, in, or, on, or also the technology sustainable potential. Then, it's important to remark the final energy intensity, the final energy demand, the estimation of final energy demand is very important and also it's very complex. Then, if we have a review in the literature to estimate the fact how other models, how they, they are, and they start, uh, estimate the final demand, the final energy demand, they are two main approaches. There are a the top-down modeling approach, and a bottom-up modeling approach. In the top-down modeling approach, normally covers in a similar way for all the sectors in the model. In these models, the energy demand uh, depends of economic of history or the, depends of historical trends of economic variables. For example, depends of the GDP. All the sectors in the energy in the system depends of the macroeconomic variable. The evolution of the energy demand in the different sectors depends, for example, of the variation of the GDP. And in the other, in the other hand, on the other hand, there are the bottom-up uh, modeling, uh, the, the bottom-up models that using a bottom-up modeling approach. These models are based on individual and use data. In, in other, it means that if they use a specific data. Specific variables, specific characteristics of the sector. For example, a very clear example are the the, the transport model, the modeling of that of the transport of the transportation sector. They estimate the uh, final energy demand depending on variables as the number of vehicles, the number of electric vehicles. The passengers kilometer, the demand of the mobility demand in passenger per kilometer or something like that. Also in buildings that maybe can depend on the square meters of buildings. Then, uh, each method has different pros and cons. As always happens when we have two options, there are some advantages of one method and some disadvantages of the other. Uh, these pros and cons are depending on the scope, depending on the aim of the modeling framework that we want, we want to model. Then, for example, in the bottom-up uh, models, uh, is the approach is the much more correct approach when we want uh, to be very precise. We, we want to define a specific sector with a lot of detail. With this, in this model, uh, can allow us to test this model can test, in, with this model we can test uh, specific policies, for example, if we change the conventional vehicles by uh, uh, hybrid vehicles, we can analyze in this kind of models. But 
this bot this button up with the specific models in this specific models we can analyze a complex situation of the of the system in these models we lost so uh, the, some effects of the refound effects or the leakage effects and on the other hand with the top-down models we can analyze we can uh, allow us for a more complex analysis of the systems but at the cost of losing the data. Uh, if uh, say before if we make a review in the literature of why or how the main items in the literature estimate the final energy demand, we can say that, for example, the message model is a model from IASA of the remind model, that is a model I think the Postland Institute of which or in roads, that is a modeling system dynamic that is very interesting because it is modeling Mensi and is developed by the developers, it is created by the developer of Mensi, and use a top down approach. And on the other hand, models like GCAM or FIMAGE are more are classified like a bottom line models. But they are not very clear, I don't know, I don't know how to say. There, uh, there are, uh, there are not a perfect approach. Then the, the, most of the models a mix both mode approach. Then uh, the models have a certain level of hybridization between approach. And this is the case of William. In William, uh, we, we have a hybrid approach between top down approach and bottom up. Uh, this is a we, we, now we are going to start to explain how estimate the final energy demand in William. Okay, then as, as we saw in the first diagram, the main objective of this sub model is to estimate the total final energy, energy demand, the green box, uh, but with variables from the economy model. This the, the final energy demand obtained depending on the economic, the monetary energy demand. Then there are a lot of arrows and, and boxes in this diagram that we are going to explain in the next slide, but it's very important to remark what is the aim of this model and also that there are uh, arrows in both directions. There are, uh, the, the total final energy demand depends on the economy model, but at the same time, the economy model depends on the final energy demand. Then we have a peak path. This is one of the main uh, advantages of William model. We have a uh, close loops. The energy model, the, when we estimate the total final energy demand, it's affects to the economy model. With the feedback that Lucas explained, that only I think that explained. Then the model, it's very important to know that it's not a linear model. It's a model with feedback, with a regulation. Then uh, I, I think, I suppose that in the previous a session, I don't know if in Yaki or in economy model, in William we have 62 sectors. One of the, uh, in this table, you can see the, the 16, uh, the first 16 sectors, but there are 62. Then in William, we estimate some sector with a bottom up approach and some sector with a top down approach. For, for what, which sector we use a bottom up approach? For, for the transport sectors, for the building sectors, the energy sector, and explain that also for mining sector, that is not finished yet. And for the rest of the sector, for example, uh, forestry, crops, fishing, or also industry sector or service sector, as health, education, or telecommun telecommunication, we use a top down approach. Then, in William is a, a hybrid model. Uh, and we, go, we are going to start to explain the first, the top down approach. This is the approach that we use for all the sectors that have not defined with a bottom up approach. The top down approach that we use in William is very similar to, one, to the one car reality in Medeas. And it's explained in this paper that I, I put in this, this link. Uh, this approach is based in energy intensities. As I said before, in, when we use a top-down approach, the final energy demand depend, usually depends on the macroeconomic uh, variable. 
sometimes they see me. If, if I may uh, comment on this, yes. if you want a really good bottom up approach, uh, you have to start from useful energy, not final energy. Yes, yes. Because final energy is uh, 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 then not seeing the energy efficiency measures and policies, especially in the building sector yes. and the transport sector, because there is a demand by investing in energy efficiency. Yes, yes, you're totally right. In our, I work, when I work in the briefing center, we start to the, uh, use energy, uh, useful energy, cooling and uh, heating or something like that. We start in this first step. And also in the economy, in the transport, we start to the mobility demand. No, we start Good. with the mobility okay. demand. I'll try to explain in the next slides. Okay. okay, then I start with top down approach and after that I'm going to the bottom up approach to the transport sector to the building sector in which we explain how I start from the from the uh, useful demand. Then the top-down approach is basic in energy intensities. Uh, usually when we use a, a top-down approach, we depend on economic variables, for example, the GDP. But in William, uh, we use the energy intensity. What is the energy intensity? I suppose that you know that energy intensity is the ratio between the energy consumption and the economic output. And energy intensity uh, is usually understood as a as an indicator of the energy efficiency in the recharge because it's very simple as a very intuitive definition. The first part of the division, the energy consumption, can be measured in different ways. For example, primary energy, final energy, useful energy, or yeah, can be disaggregated in different types of sources. And on the other hand, the uh, second part of the division, the economy output can be measured in different ways. For example, the GDP. And then in William, we calculate, we estimate the top down, the, the final energy intensity, dividing the sectoral final energy by the sectoral economic output for all the top down sectors. And this data, I have obtained, uh, we obtain this data for axio based database. Because in XEO base we have data for energy, for, prior, for final energy, for primary energy, and also we have data for all the, for the 62 sector, for the economic variables. Then we have data to the year 20, uh, 2015. Uh, then uh, it's really easy to understand that the final energy, when we use a top down approach, it, it can be estimated multiplying the final energy intensity for the output monetary of it in the economy model. And the main question here maybe will be how we estimate the evolution of the, uh, the energy intensities. And for estimate the evolution of energy intensities, we have developed a method in which the energy intensity depends on different aspects. For example, depends on historical trend, depends uh, in, for example, in a balance, we have the evolution of the different, the evolution of the different set, the, of the energy intensity by different sectors. Then we can use this evolution, we can use this data to estimate the historical trend of the different sectors. And the energy intensity also depends on other factors. For example, in William, the energy intensity depends on the improvement in energy efficiency, and also depend on the substitution of final energy. Uh, both the substitution of final energy and the improvement in energy intensity make a pressure so over the final energy intensity. And as all in William, this has feedback. And the energy intensity depends on the economy module of the materials module. For example, if there are a scarcity of lithium, 
we can substitute a conventional uh, vehicles by uh, hybrid vehicles, and this can help. Then we have feedbacks also in this part of the model. And then we are going to explain a little Uh, this part of the model is modeled by another programmer, by another developer in the promotion project that is David Alvarez. I put his email in the right, in the top right part, but I don't know how to skip this. But again, I show you his email. Then I try to explain how the uh, how David and how we we are going to develop in the, the transport sector in <laughs> Okay, then if you have some doubts, thank you. Then if you have some doubt about how is this the transport or module in Guria. I, I can I try to help you, but you can write that it's our country. And uh, I say a lot of times the main of the aim of this module is to obtain the final energy demand of the transport sector. We we have, uh, we have variables in the economic module in the transport bottom up sub model transporting the final energy demand. The, in the economic module, we have the, the, the transport demand in monetary terms. And this, this demand in monetary terms is transformed in a demand in physical terms. This is a, this, uh, we have the transportation demand in million of passengers per kilometer. And this, this demand in, in the transport bottom up sub module is, uh, is transformed into final energy demand. In, in energy terms. And I'd say in the previous, in the previous diagram, it's very important to remark that there are not, a lin, not only a linear link between economy and energy, there are feedbacks, there are close, close loops with what uh, we estimate the demand of public transportation by and also the physical energy used for private transportation by coal. And these variables are used again in the economy module to compute the expenditure for private transportation and expenditure in public transportation. And maybe I don't know if Manuel has to add something about that because he's working in that. Yeah, it's but right. it's what you have to explain. Yes. Uh, Okay. Then, uh, in this image, what you can imagine that we have a black box that is a transport bottom up sub model, but no, the transport the transport bottom up uh, bottom up sub model has a lot of variables. Have a lot of I, I don't know if you can see the the names of the variables, but I try to explain very quickly how these these models work. The model starts with the total transportation demand in physical terms, as I said before, and multiply it by the mod and we have all the data, I don't know if you can say, we have all the data by half by type of household and by region. If we multiply this transport demand by a model set, we obtain the transportation demand by mode. What is by mode? In William, we have defined different modes, different transport modes. We have light gravity vehicles, we have bus, we, have, we are talking only about passenger transport, but I don't, I don't know if I say it. The total transport demand is an exogenous variable that you. It's not an exogenous variable, it's obtained from the economy model. It's obtained from, from the economic model. 
also in the transportation bottom-up submodel. And how can we introduce the, the policies? Here we have a variable, uh, a salary, for example, that is a behavioral change. For example, uh, one policy could be the substitution of, uh, of promoting of private or pure public transportation. Then, this, this, behavior, this policy affects the modal share. And the modal share affects the total transportation demand. Also, a policy could be the promoting of the car sharing. If we promote the car sharing, the load factor of the vehicles uh, will be modified. Then we modify the demand, the vehicle with demand. I don't know if these two explanations we can answer your question. Yeah, it's like mostly uh, with the flood support uh, scenarios and so on, and there is this all the problems of how all the cities can improve the sensors. And uh, here is like the shift sensors and the improvement sensors. Yes. And the avoid sensors that is like just going down with the demand of passenger kilometers. It's only we modify the economic model and only through monetary and economic basis. So it's like there is, I don't find if there is a possibility of introduce some kind of avoiding methods in the model that are not driven by economic uh, reasons. Yes. But there's the model shift, right? The model shift is yeah. it's a behavioral policy. Exactly. The model shift will change what you mentioned. Yes, with the model shift will turn to non motorized methods. Then we modify the mobility demand. If we change, to buy private uh, vehicles to walking, then the modal share is modified. And as I said before, there are, when we have in the transport mode that we have in William, also we have non motorized transport. Then we, 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 mod, we modify with the behavioral change. This, we have a uh, voice, we can reduce the mobility demand, we can change the demand of private household uh, vehicles. To non, the amount of non motorized uh, 
Sure. At the same time, you have like a global amount of country is about 20,000 kilometers per person per year, uh, 140 miles. And if I just have a mobile system to motorize waste, you can ask people to walk 10,000 uh, kilometers per yes. person per year. So you really need to go down with about 10,000 kilometers per person here in this kind of global uh, amount of Yes, yes, it depends on. It's not the same for 3,000 kilometers that in the city center. Yes, we, we have defined this, we have this difference in the transport world. Maybe when this module is finished, we can share with you. I don't know if you have a, a list of the people of the summer school, then maybe you can share all these, all these things. Is this solution to introduce a transport model that is called staying at home? So you shift to that mode of transport, or you use that process, why not consuming anything? And it's an easy way to like trick, uh, yeah, use the model without changing anything. What about uh, modeling also the part that enables us the model which is uh, we should have the possibility to invest in infrastructure because without the infrastructure especially uh, infrastructure. There is no possibility of switching parts uh, of the demand that is burned to road transport into more sustainable yes, yes, yes. And also, you will, uh, in, in turn, you will also reduce the uh, giving out uh, so the uh, consumption of the money to, for renovation of the roads, because that is actually more expensive. Is right? so there are some additional investments, but also some savings. It only can be uh, included through policies. So you include a policy just, for example, just to support the uh, railway. We will need to invest more in railways and so on. Then later, we will suppose that they, any density will change. But this is the, the only way we have. And the yeah, policy yeah. includes some change in economy model and maybe some change in this uh, transport model. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I have and just move all the blockers there and you don't have to like create a new kind of demand side measure. But it was just one idea. I also have another question. So. Okay, I don't know how the yeah, okay. Maybe, okay. Yeah, maybe yeah, we can. Okay, I think. Yeah, yeah. But then we're going to be all in and they hope we're going to take that in years. But all this technology can be saved to build. We have an investment. Uh, at least, for example, the for electric air vehicles, for example. And if uh, you want to chain the, the technology so next in an uh, electric car, because you will have to change the technology. So uh, that's just an example of uh, <coughs> uh, that the thing that they are doing is the, the technologies that they are changing the I think, uh, Luca, sorry, regarding the coffee break, because now I think we'll yeah, do a coffee no, break, should, it, and we should, we have to take this time slot, right? They can, so I think. Uh, we make the coffee break now and yeah. we can continue. Nacho yeah. is not completely finished, but you will continue another five to ten minutes after the break. And I'd say, and now we can, meanwhile, during the break is the perfect time to continue this discussion. So, sure. Yeah. 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 Okay, then uh, I think break is from now till quarter past 11, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so quarter past 11. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when I have I introduce them slightly, but I'm just like, this is very
Before the, the, the coffee break, we are discussing some aspects about the passenger transport of model. I don't know if there are any more questions about that. We discuss a little in the coffee break, but if not, we can continue to the next, the next slide. Uh, we are talking about the passenger transport, but also there are a freight transport. And it is very important because it's very energy consuming. The trucks, the ships, the transport freights are very energy consuming. And then this module, this module is not uh, yet implemented in Wilhelm. We are planning how to do, but now this model, this submodule is not in Wilhelm yet. The general approach is to use the transport intensities for the model of the freight transport to calculate the demand in tons by per kilometer. In the passenger kilometers is passenger per kilometer, and in the freight submodule, the energy demand that we obtain in the economy module that we receive from the economy module is in tons per kilometer. And there are differences in the 62 sectors that we have in locomotion that are different sectors that uh, are related with the freight transport. For example, the 47 sector, transport via railways, the 48, and all the, the sectors that you see in this, in this table. As this is a part that is not developed yet in William. And also, I'm not working in that. I think that we can uh, pass to the next slides. And if, when we finish this, this part in William, we can share with all of you. You can check, but now I think we, can, it's not, we don't need to lose time with that. And finally, uh, another thing that is in the first step of development, is the bottom up this this bottom up sub model is doing for our uh, for the Greek uh, partner of locomotion case and for Alexander Adam as in the previous about that about building sector you can write to Alexander Adam this is his his email he's developing this model in GAMS. He's not a system dynamic model, and he's with, uh, he works in, with GAMS. And then the next step is to translate the building's submodel that in GAMS I think is almost finished to, uh, to Bensi. The, in, for this building, building submodel, there are regional classification only for European countries and UK. And you know, uh, the 2015 is the base year. The data used uh, is data from the main data set in Europe. Maybe you do know it, Eurostat, Odyssey, a Joint Research Center, and most of the more, this is, the, the most of the data is obtained from these, of these data sets. And for buildings, are disaggregated by three categories. Because single people with one person, buildings with one buildings with one person, and with buildings with multifamily. And also between rural and urban. And also because it's very important to the for the heating system, for the for the different uh, 
uh, in, in useful energies, the construction period. Then we have seven H bars that are, I don't know, uh, buildings before 2045, buildings between uh, 20, uh, 1945 and 1969, in the 70s decade, in the 80s decade, in the 90s decade. Then we have, in this model, 28 type of buildings with these three categories. The objective of this submodel is also obtain the final energy business, but depends on variables of the economy module. The variables, uh, it depends on variables as the price total heating or the income. And in the, as in the other submodules, there are a feedback. That, because there are no linear relationship between economy and energy. We have also a relationship between energy and economy. So the useful and the energy, final energy. Uh, I, this is another scheme in which I explain the same. The, the links between economy and bottom up uh, household energy module. And there are some equations. Maybe it's not the moment to, to, to explain the equation, but the model is developed, I think, out. the model, I think, that works currently, and we have equations. And I will finish, okay, uh, with the number of buildings. This is uh, the first step in the modeling system dynamic. I, I, see, I suppose that you know the stocks and the, flu uh, and the flux, and this is an example. We have the number of buildings, that depends a simple the mean construction, of contract construction and the, as output the demolitions. The new construction depends on the projection of historical construction rate basis of the GDP and the demolition depends on the historical demolition rate by home. And for retrofits, for the allocate, technology allocation, uh, use a wavebook distribution to identify the probability of the units applying different retrofits of technology replacement and takes into account the lifetime of the technology. As I said before, this is a submodel in development now, and we share with you information when we finish this, this model. As a final summary of the in-use model, it's very important to remark that the objective is to obtain the total final energy demand, and we have different methods to obtain, so bottom-up approach and so top-down approach. For transport sectors, for building, for energy sector, and for mining, our idea uh, we have the intention of new parts from motor up. Now we have for transport sector, but only for passengers. And for the rest of the sector, now buildings, energy sector, and mining sector, and by top down approach, we use the method that I explained in the previous slide with the final energy intensity. And I, I think it's all for my side. I think that if you have some more questions. Yeah, it is a really short question. The mining sector, uh, does that include like the transformation of the materials? Or the, the mining sector, I don't know, maybe Ole can help me with this question. Uh, how is to, uh, I can you repeat the question to? Yeah, the, the mining sector in the bottom of the road, does it include the transformation of the materials? Transformation of the is also included. That is like um, including the energy required for the different kinds of operators to transform it into the method that's summed up, so like the process is summed up and into the energy requirement. Thank you. Transformation, what do you mean transformation? Because the, the output of the mining sector is just the, the mineral, the pure mineral, isn't it? Yeah. Not, not the product. Yeah, but I, like, I. Like the mining concept is really a kind of abstraction, but I guess that there are many things, interesting things happening at the, at the transformation, like the refining of the material. Yeah. So there's the recycling or the like new technologies for hydrogen for stimulating or whatever. This is good, yes. I think this is good, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Or the, so like what, what we do is like we have like we have separated these different qualities and these require different kinds of energy needs 
and then uh, the material, like the energy, um, is like determining how this energy needs are met, and uh, then it gets also translated like this kind of scheme through the economy as well. But so if you want to get a low weight um, mine and process, it could be uh, the energy could be coming from fossils or it could be coming from something else. But that is outside of my hands. I just tell um, mm -hmm. this how much energy would be required to obtain uh, that material. But with material, you mean like aluminium, like finished aluminium? Or finished aluminium. aluminium or more? No, finished, finished aluminium, including the smelting. Yeah. And this is maybe like iron and steel industry, like the one you touched, it's actually on our to-do list of one of the most interesting sectors to add to the bottom-up uh, list of the end use sub module. Because there's obviously, there, there's, uh, I don't know, in the literature there's a lot going on with, uh, it's very hard to decarbonize this sector and hydrogen might play an important role. Um, but it's, it's, first we need to get the rest right, but then this will be like, Definitely a priority, yeah. Same for an aluminium process. I mean, the intensive process is the smelting process. Like we discussed also earlier, um, when, like in the last meeting with Dinat, we were discussing that it should also maybe improve the effect on the prices, but that's not done done unless you just have like the effect on the intensive forward quality, so it affects the price increase if we need more energy as well, but we want to have a direct effect on energy prices, uh, also on material prices later, but that's not something that we want to I say before, if you have a question about unrelated to a use model, please wait me or try or write David or Lucas or or Alexandros, I will try to help you with your doubts. And I think that Lucas can continue with the next model. Yeah. So I will jump into detail uh, in the transformation sub module. So again, you have the overview. Um, I will now talk about the transformation submodule and closely link also the capacity submodule. So we receive a final energy demand. So this is final energy of electricity, heat, liquid fuels, gaseous fuels, solid biofuels, and solid fossil fuels. And uh, so this is the demand. So this is one important thing. We are a demand-led model. So we receive the final energy demand and in the beginning, we were talking about transformation chain. The target is to estimate the primary energy demand that is required to satisfy this final energy demand. And uh, there is an equivalent for each of these uh, stages, also in the energy balance, as, as I said earlier. So, to get from the final energy demand to the transformation output, actually, so this is, and this is. It's like difficult to the concept, like if you're thinking of energy flow, the energy would flow from primary energy to final energy. But our calculation direction is reversed. It's the other way around because we're demand. So, uh, so we have the final energy demand. If we add transmission losses and storage losses, um, we receive the, uh, the transformation output that is required. So what our power plants have to produce. Um, what you see here as well is flexibility processes. And um, this, uh, this is important also later for the uh, variability management. So we include processes such as um, power to heat or power to hydrogen or power to gas or power to liquid fuels um, that consume electricity um, and here we have a slight inconsistency with energy balances because in an energy balance, if you have a power to heat process, it will be accounted for as a transformation input because you take electricity and you produce heat, or you take electricity and you produce hydrogen or any other fuel. So it's a, clearly a transformation process. Uh, for us, we have we decided to keep the linear style of this module to avoid iterations and simultaneous equations. So we just created a process here. So if I have more power to heat or power to hydrogen, 
I need more transformation output from my power plant. Basically. So with time energy, we add storage losses and transmission losses and these flexibility processes um, to get the transformation output that is required. And to get from transformation output to the, to the transformation input, like we know how much of the different fuels we need to produce. And to receive the quantity that needs to go into our power plants, we need to consider uh, several factors. One is the most important, is probably the, the transformation losses, obviously. So if I want to produce one unit of three units here also. And here I need to decide how much coal I need, how much of the primary energy component is. Okay? And uh, my internet connection is unstable, but I don't need it. It doesn't matter. And um, what is important here also is uh, we have simultaneously different power plant types, different types of technologies, of processes that can be utilized by the model endogenously to provide this uh, electricity, for example, or this tea. So we have different technologies, and um, the model must decide and allocate which of the technologies are used uh, to provide this electricity. Because I have a slight overcapacity, for example, and this just represents the dynamics on the market where it's um, do I, do I use electricity? Do I use gas power plants to produce my electricity, or do I utilize um, uh, renewables? The logical assumption would be uh, renewables should have a higher priority, and I will go into detail a little bit later. So, but once we have our transformation input required, so, so once we have factored in these parameters, we do know how much transformation input we need. Then if we also add uh, refining losses, and there is again efficiencies, but here we made a, sort of a distinction because refineries we do not cover in, in such a great detail. So for those electricity and heat technologies, we uh, parameterized the model, including the capacities uh, that, are available, they are, that are available, so we know for each region in locomotion how much, how much, how many megawatt or gigawatt of power plants, let's say coal-fired power plants we have, or uh, gas-fired power plants, but we don't know how, what the capacities of the refineries. This data is harder to collect by, so we kind of make a simplification here, but we do account for the losses because they are significant and. Uh, then we receive the primary energy. So this is uh, this primary energy. This is one of the major outputs that's used to calculate uh, that it goes back into the materials module um, uh, and informs the materials module. That goes back into the economic module. Um, so uh, this is our central output. Some questions to this. Because this is like really, it's very linear. In fact, it's very simple because within this transformation module itself, there's not really feedback. There does demand response for storage uh, feed uh, coming in here. Uh, they will, uh, they will come in here because in in um, actually at two different points. On the one hand, we have storage losses, and storage losses are an endogenous variable. So. Uh, uh, Gonzalo will go into detail in that later, but uh, the more renewables we have in our the storage losses will be that we need to account for. And uh, and also the more the the, the flexibility the available flexibility options will be utilized. But they will also depend, for example, on the vehicle stock, because we also assume that uh, a certain fraction of the vehicles is available for smart charging or even vehicle to grid. Gonzalo uh, will go into detail there later. So on the one hand, it will increase um, the, 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 the final energy required. Um, and then if there's curtailment, 
But if I'm right, then currently there is no curtailment in the model, right? There yeah. is true capacity factor. And okay. exactly, and this capacity factor then would also influence uh, uh, the, the amount of electricity that you can produce from the existing stock. So it reduces the capacity factor. But yeah, good question. Is there, is there any more questions? Maybe to this. No. So this, I'm not sure if I understand. The demand is not just uh, an abstract quantity uh, of energy, but already separated into the Yes, system. yes, yes, yes. There's fuels. Um, in this case, we have five final energy fuel commodities, like electricity, heat, where heat is always district heat, uh, and then solids, uh, fossil solid uh, final consumption, biosolids, liquid and gaseous fuels, and hydrogen is pure hydrogen. And can these, like the proportions of uh, fuels demanded, do they also change to the term substitute them over time according to prices? Or this would happen in yeah, the kind of energy uh, in, in the preceding module, in the, in the end use sub module. There, there will be a dedicated part for, for fuel substitution. Obviously, okay. yeah, this is um, this is an important part. Yeah, and. And then, uh, kind of, this is uh, transformation output is the same commodity as this, but here as the transformation input here changes a bit because there's no electricity here anymore, but there's different primary energy, for example. You have, uh, so it depends a bit which, uh, which commodities are available at which um, stage, which flow in your production. So this is actually the, the bigger picture. What you see here, it's ugly. You don't even need to read the details, but what, what you would see here is also the conversion chain from final energy to primary energy. Each of these squares is one conversion process. Like here's the transformation, here's the power plant. So this would be a power plant that can use, uh, I don't know, for example, gaseous fuel, fossil gas, biogas, and hydrogen to produce electricity and heat. Also, it's a CHP because it has two outputs. So like that, it is declinated through, and here's a detail, so you would have transformation input gas or fossil uh, into the CHPs and it can produce electricity or heat. So we, we put a lot of attention into making sure that we have all the technologies available that, that, that we require for our scenarios. Like all the thermal power plants, they are also, there's also an option to utilize carbon capture and storage. We don't know if we're going to use this in a, big, in a bigger extent in the scenarios, but the option is there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So this is just to show you a bit the complexity. And, and obviously, in the beginning, there was a big discussion which technologies to represent, uh, which fuels. And especially hydrogen gave us quite some headache because the structures for hydrogen are not even established yet. We didn't, I mean, hydrogen is, if you think of it, hydrogen, there's many hydrogen. It could also be synthetic liquids, uh, like synthetic uh, diesel, or, or, but it could also be ammonia, for example, used as fuel. But it, the, the race isn't over. It's not yet been decided what's going to be the main pathway. Um, but we will, and hydrogen as hydrogen itself, obviously, um, might also be an option. Yeah, it's, it might also be an option that, for example, industry companies will produce hydrogen, but only on site. So they will buy, purchase bigger power lines and uh, produce the hydrogen. I'm an industry for me, so I will only do this if I really need to. And usually you really need to need gas, natural gas now for these high temperature processes. There it's difficult to substitute. This is this hard to decarbonize sectors. And it would also be possible that they just purchase more electricity to produce hydrogen on site. But then within the uh, energy accounting framework, I wouldn't even see this hydrogen. But it's important to understand that it's still there. Because for me, it would only be electricity that I need to, uh, I need to provide sufficient electricity to supply these industries. Um, but then in the end use sub module, somewhere they need to 
good tracking account for hydrogen that is produced on site if you ever want to make a proper estimation. Do you really need to? Or is it just, actually, it's just demand side management? Well, it's demand side management and it's changing the absolute quantity, obviously, of electricity needed. So if, if a major fraction of hydrogen is 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 delivered to industries as electricity, I need to provide for more electricity. Whereas um, if if an, in terms of primary energy, it doesn't make a big change, yeah. But but uh, I need to account for it in a way or make and it's a question where where in the model I actually handle it. In in one case it's end use sub module, and in the other case it's a transformation module issue. Or variability management actually will come later as well. Yeah, but the future, the race is still open, so we don't we can we don't have a glass bowl and see the future, but we can only uh, make scenarios, my guesses. All right. Uh, so one thing I might want to draw I want to draw your attention is this allocation functions because this is a this is a common problem in system dynamics models. This is always needed when you have um, <laughs> you have a mismatch of, of, of supply and demand or potential mismatch. So in in dancing there are several equations that are available to you allocation functions they're called and there's is differentiation between one to many or many to many allocation problems. So in the energy module, this is uh, what I said earlier, we have a certain demand for, let's say, electricity, like one demand that we need to allocate to many different power plant types. So it's a one to many allocation. And in Benzium, it works relatively simple in a way that you, uh, that you, have this allocation function where you give the different you, you put in your demand and your um, uh, the different technologies and then you give them priorities. Um, so it works with priorities and the outcome uh, of this function is is not going to necessarily be like a cost optimal solution, but it's a certain allocation. So the demand is satisfied by this and this and this technology according to the um, their priorities. So having this, like this is an example. It's like mock data and just illustrative. But you have the the, product, the possible production volumes on the x-axis, and then you have the priority from one to zero. Like one is highest priority, zero is the lowest priority, and then you more or less the, the function, this allocation function, more or less orders is um, quantities that are available. Then you have your demand. So basically, uh, those technologies that are to the left side, they will be utilized, and those that are to the right side, they won't be. And then there's a certain, to make smoother mixes, there's some other parameters where you can take into account those and those in the vicinity to a certain extent also. Uh, but that's kind of mathematical detail. Um, um, it's important is so what... Huh? This looks a bit like uh, a merit marginal order. markets. Like a merit order, yeah, but uh, this is actually one, one of the questions. What's the difference to reality? Because this resembles a little bit the merit order that is all over the media right now, because that's the way how electricity uh, prices are made. And one huge difference is that uh, profit margins tend to be, or markups are much higher in the fossil industries than in the renewables, right? So. The prices do not reflect the marginal costs. Uh, no, I know that absolute profits will be higher uh, in, in solar, of course, but because of because the, like the supply is much more concentrated in most industries. There's just only one paper I read that they said that because uh, there's, there's less competition in that sense. Although of course the energy carriers are substitutable. Somehow, all companies still manage to put much higher markets. You have to negotiate with power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you are the last one that has to do in the gap. Yeah, I am. I don't know. This is this already quite a detail. Is there any other? Where is this idea of what could be like a. Uh, uh, in markets, in territorial demand will not be perpendicular, but. Uh, but, but also like this, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The demand is actually a curve. 
the amount should actually be occur, which would uh, in a way come from uh, also from uh, demand response. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is more uh, cheaper electricity, your demand is growing. This is mm -hmm. this is actually you can if you would have a demand curve here, it would be a many-to-many -many allocation problem, like in, in theory, because then I would have, have different demand sources. Different supply sources, and then I could uh, allocate them both to, to make the fit. But what, but what else? Even, even more like basic. So, on, on one hand, like, actually, the, the demand for electricity is very very low. I mean, the, the, the curve in, in the sense of trade, the end use electricity, there is no one to really work except for some. Industries is that one side production. Let's be sure. We now see with very increased prices that this industry starts to be about um, yeah, uh, monetized on, on demand. So the price goes up, there must be shedding. Um, um, and we have people staying out of electricity. There is no phys other physical way. And what is happening now is that they are subsidizing in some countries uh, domestic users. And thus shedding more electricity in the industrial use. Yeah, we see that some, some, I don't know, some plants producing um, fertilizers to leave into the market because they do not, they cannot can compete. Yeah. And we see in other industries too. This would be um, some kind of demand response. But usually it's called demand destruction because. But that's more demand sharing where we are now. Uh, it's not really demand response. Demand response if you move demand from uh, expensive part of the day to cheap part of the day. But now you yes. have expensive electricity all day long. Yes. So we are actually sharing demand. Yeah, I'm trying to yeah, destroy it. Yeah. Demand destruction and also similarity, um, like destroying like, real assets in terms yeah. of industry. Yes. Mm -hmm. GDP. And no, but the, what I actually wanted to, to also point on is that we use annual production volumes. And this is like the merit order is based on 15 minute values they ahead. So we have one of these curves for every 15 minutes, you know, 24 hours ahead. And so because it changes from hour to hour, like what is available on resources and, and what's the demand. And so we do, and this is one of the big limitations of the model, because we have annual time steps. We have, we have only annual values and they don't you know, necessarily come to the same result as, as you know, a real market with a you know, this you know, model, with a dispatch model, for example, or a real market. And for this priority factor, maybe it's also important, it's obviously very important what is this priority? For, for which fuels do I give which priority and where does it come from? And we plan to uh, have a, a mix of endogenous and exogenous variables. So we have operation expenditures, OPEX, like fuel costs, which is obviously a very important factor. And this, this information is endogenous in the model. So that's great. That's another feedback loop. Um, but also we want to allow for some policy um, um, priorities, because it might be the way, for example, that, that politics decides to support carbon capture and storage, let's say. And although they are usually quite expensive, they still want to do this, or nuclear, whatever. So we have the degree of freedom to um, put in the policy here as well. All right, so much, so much for the allocation. Uh, so the second major thing, besides the transformation, this allocation is also the, the capacity, because that's strongly interlinked, obviously. I can only transform uh, according to the limits of the existing capacity. And so um, we do have a very simplified capacity structure. We have a lot of different production technologies for electricity and heat. Um, uh, and we do have small stock flow. I think you're familiar with this notation already and then you did the gold coin thing. I mean, you can't read now here because the quality is really bad, but uh, I just want to demonstrate 
Um, so basically, you have a stock of technologies. You have some, some uh, it's a capacity in megawatts, let's say. And some of it is phased out each year, and some of it uh, kind of is added each year. And, what, and this is a this is a um, this is a vector or um, uh, an array. So basically, there's like all these forty something technologies that we have. So this it's done simultaneous. So um, this technology has a maximum potential production. If it would run all the time as much as it can, it would produce a certain amount of electricity. Then I have an actual Demand, so there is potentially a gap, and in this demand, I also need to account for additional growth. So I, I plan for some overcapacity, which is important to avoid shortages, if possible. And uh, so I do need how much capacity. I do know how much uh, electricity I need additionally in, in 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 the time step, and this is allocated here to the different technologies. And then these technologies, they are added to the stock. So it's a, a really basic uh, loop. Uh, and, and the effect it has is, for example, here just um, the, the, the way that the allocation function, for example, works, because here we have another allocation function that decides which technology is added. So the one thing was which technology is utilized to produce electricity, and the other thing, which, which uh, <coughs> works more long term, is uh, which capacity do I add to the system? And this I also need to allocate. So, for example, uh, our gas fuels have a low priority, liquid fuels have a even lower priority, and, uh, and the renewables have the highest priority in adding to the total pool of um, power plants. So, over time, what happens? The stock of those with a lower priority will decrease, and the stock of those with a higher priority will increase. Um, the decommissioning, you know, the outflow uh, will also decrease because less and less fossil fuel power plants are in the mix, so also less and less are getting decommissioned, while uh, the decommissioned quantities also of the renewables will increase because there's just simply more of them, so also more phase out. And um, yeah, the capacity expansion, this is just here to show that None of the fossil fuels are, are, are added to the system, and, um, and only the renewables are added. So it works more or less as intended, although it's not completely up to date as well. But uh, the general principle is very simple, actually. Please. How do you, like, in reality, a lot of fossil fuels are being added to the system? So, how do you, like, bring this, the model results in consistency with the data? Um, actually, with, with what we can do is we can, we, and what we did do uh, is calibrating the system like the uh, energy production in the base here, like make sure that the output matches, like taking the final energy from energy balances and make sure that the primary energy that the model calculates is not too far off from the actual primary energy, primary energy that we get from the energy balances. So this is, this we can do and we, Calibrate all the factors accordingly, but for the capacity itself, uh, it's more difficult. We cannot. These these are often very political decisions. So we take this exogenous. It's basically it's exogenous, um, and we, you can only set plausible assumptions and validate that like what the model model does is you know plausible, but really. Modeling that, like on on empirical basis, let's say for the last thirty years, um, making a system dynamics model which capacity was added. I mean, who? How would you model, for example, Fukushima and the impact that it had? That all of a sudden also Germany was dropping out of nuclear, but now they aren't. Uh, so I don't know. It's uh, difficult. So it's exogenous. Whenever it's difficult, it's exogenous. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But uh, extraneous variables are quite interesting because it's the one that you can modify if you want, so you can play with the with the model. The model is not a deterministic model to, to to watch what is going to happen in the future. Just you formulate any hypothesis, you change parameters, whatever you want, and you will see. So extraneous is not so very bad from this point of view. <laughs> mm. And there's also other feedbacks that are not here in the loop. 
But in fact, if I add a lot of capacity of solar PV, for example, the solar PV sector will grow and it will demand more resources from the other sectors, which will demand more materials also, but they might be rare. It will also demand more electricity. Uh, and, and so there's feedbacks inherent because the investment here, this is investment, and that also feeds back into the economic model. So is the investment entirely private? Or is that also public investment? Well, this well this, is, this is not just physical investment. Actually, I just sent the economic module how much megawatt I was. They translate that into kilo and into sector, and I'm, I'm not totally. Uh, it's a capacity investment, physical investment. I'm, I'm actually and not. Economic investment comes from. But how, how this is financed, uh, actually, I'm, I'm not uh, totally sure. Well, because there's a finance model in the, in the economic model, but, but in the economic module, I'm not so confident to. Uh, exactly. But energy side, it's fine. So this is how it works here. And yeah, that's it, I think. Uh, are, are there, if there aren't any questions regarding these two parts, energy and capacity, uh, I will hand over to Gonzalo, who will introduce you to the way how we treat uh, variability in the model. Great. I need to share this. Can I share this? So you don't need to talk. Yes. Because this is here is for things that. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I know you are a good student. I will uh, start this part by asking you um, because this topic, the variability of renewables, was introduced in day two by eleven today as well. So why do we need more than what uh, Lucas explained before? If we have the energy transformations. Uh, tables and uh, that's uh, already implemented in William. Why do we need more than, than the, the models of Lucas? Why? Uh, what effects or what uh, impacts can be can be modeled from uh, inventing? Uh, because uh, these effects are breaking some. In, in the yearly basis. What happens if we boost a lot of the renewables? It's really like uh, the incumbency of the renewables, you can see the all the bits that they have. Yeah, that's one. So we have the supply and the demand side, we need to match them instantaneously. Um, based on the statistical results, uh, the literature says, for example, that we need at least eight hours of resolution. Uh, and the, our model, William, is yearly basis. So we need something to couple, something to solve some 
little issues, which is the motivation of uh, the, this touch 7.4 in locomotion. Then uh, we will see the, an overview of the idea we have, we are implementing. The selection of inputs and outputs, and we will talk about this, and the current state of, of the method. In Medeas, we, it was developed this tool, uh, the, the smart and simple uh, solution, the capacity factor of renewables, such a, like, um, considered as baseload, for example, geothermal, um, was decreasing because of the variable renewables penetration increase. So if you supply with renewables, variable renewables, you cannot supply it with others. Because if you have a surplus of electricity at any time, you will have a shut down. Okay? And on the other side, you can see that the capacity factor of renewables, the variable renewables, um, will increase their you will have an overcapacity due to this uh, penetration, but um, there are some... If we go from the uh, sub-second sub resolution to the yearly resolution, you can um, find, so, uh, for example, um, the quality, you can model the quality of electricity in terms of harmonics and uh, physic, uh, physic effects in the in the grid. Uh, we can go to the hour. Uh, what happens in the hour? For example, um, which power plant provides electricity each hour and to supply the demand at those levels? The energy management, and we can we can go to the energy planning over time. So there are um, many difficulties to to couple this in model. And you, as you can see here in this image, we can talk about two fields. The field of power, which is related with the operation, operational constraints and, and so on in the, energy, in the grid, towards the, the energy, which is related to, related to the year, the global management, and so on. So, for example, the technical um, technical issues that we handle are the energy management, from the energy management to the global management of planning, and economical, for example, the income technology and planning of new investment. Um, what is the overview of the idea? Uh, our idea, as was, it was introduced, was is to use energy plan, because it has an hourly resolution, and we try to um, to fulfill the inputs with some a rank to achieve an outputs and create a statistical model for William. Um, why did we don't use other type of approaches? For example, the linking with an external code because we don't have a benching hasn't got a, a specific function to do it. So we cannot directly link energy plan with benzene. Also, we need a, a fast uh, method. Why? Because as you probably know now, um, William is so large. So if we have, for example, a model taking into account many relationships in the power system, a very accurate one, like Plexus, I don't know if you like, you know Plexus, it's a power system uh, model. Uh, it can, it maybe consider, um, spend one hour, for example. But in our model is one hour per region, <laughs> per year. So <laughs> we need a fast uh, method. Um, or for sure, due to mathematical restrictions, we, don't, we cannot have multi time frames inside. We can only deal with, play with the time frame of one year or the time step, which is not enough. Uh, we, can, the time, we cannot reduce up, up until the below eight, uh, the eight hour resolution. So basically, this is a set. Basically, our idea at the beginning, since the beginning was after a discussion, it was uh, to create, generate a multiple linear regression model. 
um, as simple as possible to understand if uh, we can work uh, with these approaches, if these approaches uh, fit well or not in, in system dynamics. And then we maybe can go farther, no? but the beginning, the first step is uh, to generate a multiple generation model in which uh, we take the infrastructure. Here below are the required uh, capacity, plane capacity, stack capacity, the different steps of the structure in, over time in, in William, which, which was developed by, by Lucas and the ADDT. Um, so, based on the yearly conditions of this structure, we use it as an input. For example, the capacity, the instant capacity megawatts of uh, power plants, instant capacity of uh, storage, and so on. And as an output, we provide the yearly resolution. So we cannot see, for in this case, it's like the black, a black box, let's say. Uh, we cannot uh, provide in the Benzin model the relationships inside energy plan. You have played the day two with energy plan, right? So uh, you cannot see the equations, but you can understand what happens if you increase or not the different capacities, the different strategies, and so on. So in order to develop this um, this uh, this model based on regression, we need to take into account something very which is a, a limitation: the number of inputs and the resolution per input. Why? Because as you can see in the top and right, um, it's an exponential increase. Uh, we combine the inputs. If we have, for example, one point, uh, one value for each input, we only have one combination. Uh, if we increase up to seven, then um, five points per cluster, uh, per input. Um, we can go more or less up uh, to seven variables with five points. Uh, but with eight uh, variables, we are um, on the top of 5,000 days per, uh, to simulate all of, this, of the simulations, taking in, considering that we spend one second uh, per simulation energy plan, which is another strong, uh, um, yes, uh, to use uh, the model. So uh, we currently are using 14 uh, variables and three points per, per variable. But as you can think now, um, we, we cannot model all the system with 14 variables. No? We need something more. Um, so we go into class. We have some inputs defining the technology, some inputs defining the demand, and then we play with them uh, based on our knowledge and the experience with energy plan to cluster the inputs. So we have, for example, here the heat pumps. Uh, we have five uh, five uh, inputs in energy plan related with heat pumps: the capacity of compression heat pumps in megawatts, the efficiency, the cost, the thermal storage uh, for this uh, technology, the annual demand of heat, and the hourly distribution of heat demand. Well, what we do? Um, uh, we assume a representative input, in this case the capacity, and we relate the rest with this representative input. So for example, uh, we consider the efficiency as a, as a constant. We, and we consider uh, the thermal storage the, uh, the, as, a, um, as the capacity of compression pump times 4 divided by 1,000. Okay? Um, so now I'm going to show you, so for example, here you can see uh, the 14 clusters. This is how we work. You, uh, solar PV is just, uh, we only need um, the capacity, the instant capacity of uh, solar PV. And the other input is the hourly distribution, which are constant in all the simulations. So we have some, Assumptions and hypothesis to 
do over do, do goal to, to the end of the, the this approach. The second one is a uh, win. The third one is a uh, run of river, which has no storage. The, third, the fourth one is uh, a, a nuclear, and also, well, we name it here as a semi-flexible power plant. So we assume that the nuclear power plant, geothermal uh, power plants, and dam hydro power plants are running in a similar way in the electricity market and energy, in terms of energy. Um, then we go to stationary storage in, in the grid, uh, which, co which um, comprehends um, the pump hydro storage and the um, electric batteries in it, the large electric battery. But also we need to take into account not only the supply side of the system, but also the demand side. So we include one input uh, for heat demand. So and like a wall district heating in which uh, some technologies can um, deliver, can um, receive, can transform electricity to, to heat, uh, to represent the power to heat the technology, for example, the heat pump, which are also represented, and the heat speed, so the yeah, electric boilers, electric vehicles, and hydrogen. Well, we introduced three, I mentioned before, we introduced three values per input, and the relation between uh, the representative input and the related input. And all of them are modified in the input file of energy plan. Energy plan is simulated and then the results are gathered and a regression is performed. Then we um, go with those regressions to the to benchmark. And that's the way we, we carry out this work. Um, well, currently I want to show you the, the most. Currently, the, we have 4,000, 4,700,000 of simulations being performed based on this limitation. It takes more or less one month. So I guess I'm going to be able to show you okay. So this is the code in, in Python. Uh, we well maybe this is the expert the expert is uh, Luca Erk in this case. Um, so we apply parallel processing to perform all these cases. Uh, it's an important improvement in the code, as you can imagine, because we can perform 60 yeah, simulations per, at the same time. Um, well, that's that's all from my from my side. Uh, do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, you actually you build a library or? Then the model just looks after themselves. Yeah, basically, the regression runs like a. Um, um, yes, like a. Um, takes into account all the input and input data. So the, you are confident with the relationship. Obviously, we report some statistical parameters to. You know if it goes well or not. Uh, I forgot to say something <laughs> important, uh, which is the fact that we have uh, published this um, article in renewable energy, so you can check for the technical details. Um, ah, oh, yes. <coughs> Here there are many researchers. Uh, Luca El, Gantun was also here in the summer school. Inigo, um, Ilya, Neven, uh, Luis, and Vladimir Georgievsky was also in, in his service.
Mm -hmm. um, more questions? I have solved the question or have I solved? I think what's, what's interesting is that because we're trying to circumvent the problems of, you know, that you actually need a dispatch model to monitor this, you know, sub annual time step dynamics, you actually would need a, an hourly model, but uh, integrated assessment models, they can't work on an hourly basis or you would completely um, kill the computational resources. <laughs> uh, and also the data requirements would be enormous for, you know, five regions, you know, uh, for sorry, 30, 35 regions. <clears throat> so uh, the idea is to make a lot of runs and emulate the results, like all possible options, uh, of, well, combinations of options, and then emulate the results with a multiple linear regression, which goes very quickly. And, uh, and I think, and, and uh, Earlier, I showed you where these hooking points are to the annual energy balance. Because if, if the energy plan result shows you that, tells you that you need more uh, storage, for example, or you run your storage more, then it will be uh, accounted for an annual energy balance uh, by additional storage losses, for example. Yes. If you, for example, uh, have overproduction and and use those, this overproduction to generate hydrogen, you need to take into account the change in the energy balance. You will have more electricity in the, in the, in the hydrogen sector and an output in the, in the gas sector. Okay. It's a really complex thing. Um, is there any other questions? Because you, you have been actually faster, you picked up all the time that we oh, okay. managed to lose. Uh, so, so because lunch is only at one, right? So, okay. um, okay. we have 35 minutes. So, the question is uh, we, uh, Ole and me, we prepared a, a little Benzim example, or we are in the process of actually preparing the, the model like that you did the last week. So we are extending that by an by energy module, let's say, modeling the energy transition in Fairyland, uh, that's the idea, for the afternoon. Um, but now we would also have 35 minutes. 35 minutes. I yeah. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, I think that's not like a question, Ron. I think that's actually a discussion. Yeah, because, uh, okay, so first we had this, um, you explained the, the energy balances, but in fact, when I remember the so the, like the chain of transformation. Mm -hmm. And you showed that they were like, was trying to read a bit. And it, it is not following the classification or the element of the product. So you have like four series of products in the commodity, not the one that we sold. And so the, the thing is here that I saw that there were four series products and there are also agricultural products. But that's what I, I expect. So uh, the first series. Uh, how is, is, I guess this is uh, connected to the land module, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, to, to, to kind of rephrase the question, you, you saw that we have a primary energy forestry product and we have primary energy agricultural products, uh, yet in the energy balances you usually only have a primary solid biomass, usually, um, but you do have uh, biofuels, for example, which are usually made from agricultural products. I mean, this is um, sometimes this exactly the reason why we wanted to do this and, and wanted to have this disaggregation is because in the land module they are also modeling um, the production, the food production, and so agricultural products are potentially like there's a, a competition of uh, using it for food or using it for fuel. Basically, and we want to be able to to cover this dynamic in in, in, the, in the model. And, I mean, yeah, 
you have to there is no agricultural products kind of commodity in the energy balance. Um, so for 20, but, but you could even, there's also no hydrogen commodity in the energy balance, for example. So there we kind of start with the assumption that in the base here it's zero and then, um, well, actually for, for fuel and agricultural products, I'm not sure we haven't, we haven't arrived there because we haven't established the link to the land module yet. Uh, but this will be one question that pops up like for the power mechanization once we, when we do the links uh, make sure that, that it kind of works to be added for example with the power starts data but I'm not sure if because the food, you will have to listen about it and, um, and, and but when we link this we need to make sure that we are consistent or is this answering your question, or is it question? Uh, well, I like I expected that it was an ecosystem. I like I've been working a bit with it, and I know that it's a mess, and then I'm making other things. Like, and yeah, like, I don't know what to say. We, we, we could we could open up um, an energy balance example from the oral stuff and see where we find biofuels. And it's, uh, you, you can work years in, in energy balances and, and uh, still find out things that are surprising to you. And when you ask yourself, why is there this value in this cell? How does it make sense? What's the physical representation of this flow? Um, and also, uh, another thing is, well, and, uh, I, I was working with uh, Sweden. So I also work with the uh, energy balances of Sweden, which are a bit different. And Sweden might be a bit, a bit like a, an exceptional country because we have a, a, a forestry sector that is really huge compared to the, to the country, let's say. And the primary, primary biomass that is shown in the energy balance of Earth, so is disaggregated in many other things in the energy balance of Sweden, which makes sense, but they are interested mm -hmm. in this. But then you find that it is not really primary because it's a, there's a large share of a, a subgrant of the, of the part of the industry. So yeah. non energetic use in the industry, mm -hmm. you mean? No, that the, the part of the industry is generating a waste that they are using for combustion in the same industry. The paper industry. Yeah. <laughs> so if they say there's this primary biomass uh, category in Europe, so then it's not that common. But yeah. I mean, uh, with, with, this is actually a common problem in energy balances, and this applies to many regions, is, is how to account for the biomass. Because oftentimes, um, this this never sees a, a, a counter, you know, because if people go into the forest and collect their own firewood, let's say, and they fulfill their energy demand, but there is no in, in statistical accounting, you really do have troubles accounting for that because you don't know how much it is. And especially in, I'd say, less developed countries, this is a, this is a significant, significant fraction in, uh, in, in energy consumption for heating. In, in, I know in Serbia, for example, an example there, there was like in, in solid biomass consumption, it was on a, on a low level, and then in one year it was rising like this, and then continuing on this level, and then he asked, said, "What the fuck is happening here?" And uh, well, it is that they changed the, uh, the accounting methods. Yes. I think it's like a bit. It's not correct to say that biomass is only in less developed country. No. Uh, the shadow market is also in Austria. We have huge problems like collecting data about firewood and the use of firewood as an energy carrier in more Austria as a uh, primary energy source. It's, it's very difficult. And it's, it's also in the same accounts for a lot of countries that do have very functional digital markets. All the other energy carriers, good energy carriers, a lot of countries, and it should be traded as 
Mm. It's also difficult to set the kind of price. There's like very clear prices for electricity, but for firewood, like someone might buy from his neighbor who has a patch of forest, and uh, the other one buys it from somewhere from a shop and pays five times the, the price. And, and what's the real price? I mean, it becomes really difficult there. Mm -hmm. I have two new questions. Um, one, uh, how do you deal with uh, carbon removal technologies? Uh, are there any energy sector with some produce energy and other form? Mm -hmm. And the second question is uh, maybe a little bit of, of, about how you calculate the dynamic uh, invoice. Oh, okay. Uh, well, with regard to the carbon removal, this is actually on our list of to do. <laughs> I mean, there's different types of carbon removal, but for the direct air carbon capture and storage, which is a technology I don't think will play a big role because the energy consumption is huge. Um, so unless we have fusion reactors in 10 years, then I don't know, I don't see it like happening. But anyway, uh, so the way we, I was envisioning how we could include it uh, is its own uh, bottom-up module in the end use sub-module. So basically, direct air carbon capture is an own uh, energy consumption sector. Um, and for power plants, the way we include it is that basically for all thermal power plants, we have a conventional power plant technology, like a conventional coal-fired power plant. And then we have a conventional uh, coal-fired power plant with CCS. And with CCS, um, uh, the carbon removal is zero. Uh, sorry, the carbon production is zero, um, and it uh, has a different efficiency. But we need to calibrate this if we really have scenarios that that that, that then we need more accuracy there. But so it would have a lower efficiency, and it would have car uh, carbon of zero. What we do not model explicitly outside the border is carbon storage capacity. Because this is actually a big issue. Um, we did an estimation, for example, for Austria, if we would use our uh, natural gas storages that are currently already used to store gas uh, uh, and fill them with carbon. And if we take our whole national carbon emissions and fill them into these storages, after four years, the storages would be full. And then we would have no storage capacity for carbon anymore. So, um, but there's other technologies uh, um, that one might, <clears throat> I don't know, the other day I heard, I was discussing with a biologist if it's feasible to, um, I read about this uh, carbon removal strategy that you take straw, straw walls basically, and you go to a deep patch of sea, you put it on a ship, Go into the sea and you dump it in the sea and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean and it's going to be sequestered there for hundreds of years, you know. And making new, exactly, hundred thousand of years, in hundred thousand of years, uh, uh, the alien species will kind of find it. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, this, this biologist, for example, I thought. It's a brilliant idea. It's, it's, it's certainly less energy intensive than direct air capture and storage. Um, yet he said in, in his picture of the future, there would be a competition for this. Like this, like straw is the new, new raw material for the chemical industry and for other industries who compete for carbon sources to make their plastics and or whatever. So, um, but the biggest one, I think, currently in discussion really is, is the bioenergy carbon capture and storage because they could really create negative emissions. And this, this technology we have, uh, we have a negative stream of emissions. Um, yeah, but, but as I said, the storage capacity is outside the system boundary in our case. So we need to make sure in our scenarios that we don't exceed limits beyond the, you know, unreasonable amount. Maybe Austria is a really bad example, because they have storage space uh, in the North Sea, for example. So, uh, if you look at, for example, the emissions of Denmark, they could store 
in the volumes and the aspects of the Solana and it was related to the plant. So, I guess it would also depend a bit on how well we can transfer the CO2 across the borders. Mm, yeah, CO2 pipelines, yeah. <laughs> this sort of stuff. <laughs> it would be an interesting next module to the. <laughs> If you take these scenarios uh, seriously, you have to kind of put some thought into that. Yeah, okay, 200 times, I don't know, but I do know that Denmark has a lot of natural or had a lot of natural gas production yeah. and it has relatively little emissions currently. So, yeah, well, they're basically going into the now. They also, because it's primarily in Norway, it also has a lot of storage capacity. And then we could also like to go into the carbon storage sector, but maybe they are going a bit behind. So I'll see. But yeah, they are going to go into the Have you asked also uh, about the airway? Yeah. Yeah. Um, here, this is one, I mean, uh, a paper developed by some colleagues from the University of Valladolid. This is the, I would say, the closest approach in, to see what, um, how we model the ROI in, in this William, uh, because it was implemented in Medea. So, you, I mean, uh, I, this I, is I, one of the authors. There are um, two different approaches. Static ROI, that is just a ROI for each energy uh, uh, technology, so you can more or less estimate according to each technology and the, the knowledge about this technology, materials that we need, the energy we need for these materials, transport and so on. And this is another way that is the dynamic ROI. Dynamic ROI is uh, quite interesting and novel because uh, well, the, the main idea is that in the energy transition we are going to build a lot, of, we hope to win a lot of uh, power <coughs> power system based on renewable energies. So during these years of, uh, let's say, a growing uh, investment in renewable uh, power systems, uh, power and renewable systems, we are going to invest a lot, not only money, but also energy, just to build it, but we are not going to get so much energy in these years. So we are building more systems than the, the systems that they are already built. So, uh, instead of uh, estimate the UI through all the uh, average life, let's say 25 years or something like that, so we try to estimate every year UI for all the systems. So how many, how much investment we need to build uh, the new power plants, and how much energy we are going to obtain. So, so year by year, uh, finally the results we 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 can we can see. I don't know if there is in the graph there, but some interesting results and art is that the ROI go like that. First, there is a reach of minimum value and then a new, uh, a new increase of the ROI. This is because in certain time we only, we not only have the decrease of the year by itself, the static one that is lower than usually uh, fossil fuels, but also be, because we are building so many power, new power plants. After we finish, let's say finish, uh, most of them, all the power plants, we, we, we increase again the ROI a little bit. But during, but during some time, this minimum ROI means that we are going to need a lot of energy just for the transition of the uh, system. And this is uh, let's be say a little bit dangerous, maybe. Well, uh, in Queen of Shore, you, you see this, but, but this is the uh, ROI. Well, this is for each technology, I mean. But uh, I was thinking in the, the global one, well, that's not. It's the same. This is for each technology. Yes, I was thinking, yes, yes the previous one. Uh, no, another one. <laughs> Uh, yes, this yes, this this upper graph. I was trying this goes 
these are uh, uh, <coughs> which are different uh, uh, penetration of um, green technologies by 50, 70, 100. So with the higher penetration, the gyro I decrease quicker and then recover a little bit. So obviously we, we need a uh, to the limit. It's close to the limit. Wow, there are several several how to, how written about what is the minimum limit for zero I to be a sustainable society. Uh, this is a let's see, big discussion. Some authors consider that we cannot live under five. Other authors consider that the life the life is going to be very difficult under ten. So this is another kind of discussion. But anyway, this value may be quite dangerous. Anyway. <coughs> For some scenarios, of course, yeah. it's not always the I have a question regarding your EOI because uh, you said that renewables have a lower EOI than. This is a, a very general approach. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we have to get into the detail each technology, each case, and it's no, not so I clear. Think, but, but, yeah. I've seen, like, this is like the general assumption, but then there's people that say, no, they are similar if you account, like, if you are transforming to electricity and if you are. Like, Yes, it's difficult to, to give a general uh, assumption because for each technology, and I mean each sub-technology, it's not all the wind technology is not the same, or not, not all the photovoltaic energy is not the same, and also it's not the same in each country under certain conditions, it's not the same that the solar PV in, in Spain that we have a lot of hours, that maybe in the north of Germany or something like that, so it's it's very difficult to give a general assumption about what's that happening, but statistically, in the general point of view, uh, we can consider that uh, it's lower in general terms. Also, for fossil fuels, it happens the same. It, it does the, it, it's not the same the year of uh, petroleum just uh, 50 years ago that the, uh, the shale oil in the United States today. So it's. <laughs> We have to go into detail, but uh, if you aggregate all the sources and all the technologies with the knowledge we have just now, uh, we see that the euro is decreasing. But I recognize that it is a topic to discuss. <laughs> you can find, no, oh, this technology, in that case, is much better than the code, maybe. <laughs> okay. I think from a perspective of William, what we can also add is that, uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, partly endogenous in, in the term that um, it's included in this material economy energy feedback loop. As, uh, for example, if there's more wind production, the wind economic sector will increase. And so in the input output matrix, it will draw more demand from other sectors, like, for example, the steel production sector. and. Uh, so um, the steel production will increase more energy demand and so it's kind of included that the energy required for producing the, the capital stock and of this is included in our total energy side. So from that point of view it's, um, it's endogenous, although obviously limited by the types of energy commodities that we actually look at in detail. So you cannot model every energy and also it's really difficult to account for substitution effects in the future. When I look at lithium batteries, is lithium battery going to be the technology in, in, in 30 years or is it going to be natrium, which currently needs much less resources, I don't know, who knows, uh, it cannot make scenarios. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, um, and this is the same, we can a little bit reduced in terms of the and focus more on those cycles. So you can reduce waste, you can reduce the necessity for new sources. Um, the new oil or for the three are so the it's a closed circle and we have already built up the capacity. But on the other hand we have to think about where does the energy come from to build up the capacity? So in other words, it might be a very silly idea to 
placed our remaining carbon budget on driving around rather than producing huge capacity of solar PV um, to air generation. There might be a big chance in this right now that we can put some energy on inside of So we don't have to because this uh, the remaining carbon budget to build up uh, renewable capacity. We were locked down for two years. Yeah. 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 Why not? Yeah. If there's a lockdown, please do it right now while I'm in development. <laughs> <laughs> so you would uh, predict the uh, numbers of this uh, school to come to this summer school. Oh, to leave, by the way, the prohibition is right now. Everybody stays where it's on. But there is no source of equality in the world in Canada and Judaism. So we should uh, cannibalize each other here in uh, approximately uh, one week. Yeah. Now, uh, if you look at uh, the carbon content of the products due to transport, it's rather small. Uh, unless you transfer food by planes, it's negligible. No, I, I did not. I did not mean the, the transfer content of the capacities. I meant the energy spent nowadays on transport, which is uh, significant. Yeah, we spent twelve of birth of our. Uh, Energy demand and also approximately twelve. We can reduce it by a factor of four by the electrifying But I was not, not really talking about the, the energy that we need, but about the remaining carbon budgets. Yeah. Yeah, we can decide what we want to do with this remaining carbon budget. We can either use it for transport, for driving around, or we could use this remaining Budget to build up huge capacity of sustainable energy generation. Okay, but are you taking into account of uh, social barriers to change? Definitely, yeah. yeah. It might be a, a, That's the most difficult one. That, that was, when, what was I meant when I said it might be a stupid idea to just use the remaining capacities to transfer for the reason. But if we uh, ban uh, internal combustion engine cars now, it is get much faster. And also gas boilers. So gas boilers yes. are the worst possible technology that you can imagine. Who is here heated uh, by a gas boiler? Yeah, you see, <laughs> you're the only bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> no. Ah, there is another bad way. <laughs> Yeah, but actually, yeah, okay, that's, that's, a, that's also a huge problem because they can't really decide. So in, in Vienna, you, you rent a flat. It's not your decision. Not it's your not your decision. decision, yeah, that's a problem. And I, I think there are some policies in the making. But the people who protest against that yeah. are in the street. I mean, most people don't care. Yeah, about has it. actually a very good policy. They are now uh, starting to remove gas boilers. They do, and they start to. to at least thinking about the, the, the political discussion is all going about um, introducing a penalty on um, the rent you are allowed to take if you have a gas pump in the water. But yeah, I think that there are a lot of interests, influential people from properties or the system is strong. Most people, the average guy, do not care about energy. Because, for example, for transport, we have a solution, but we cannot implement it quickly. But for gas boilers, we have a solution and we can implement it. But for oh. gas boilers are much worse from the point of view of uh, carbon budget. Yeah, sorry if I'm. Uh, no, no, actually, that's a good discussion because I think. Uh, I think there is in some areas it's too. It's like, like, I wouldn't agree to the quickly. I wouldn't agree that we can implement them quickly. Well, how how much time you need to put uh, district heat in there? 
Two years, three years? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's uh, okay, okay, quickly. That's quickly. That's quickly. But for car transport, it would be a huge cost if we ban uh, internal combustion cars from the roads now. I don't think it's feasible yeah, it's, in anything less than 20 years. The average so lifetime of a. Uh, sorry? We do quickly ban combustion engines in our horizon. There is a phase out and uh, phase in and phase out problem. And this one is much longer because you cannot just throw all the existing cars into garbage. That would be a huge uh, environmental cost. Mm -hmm. And we don't have enough capacity to uh, replace it with batteries. We don't have uh, battery production capacities. But for district heating, I mean, it's only quite So we have a big I mean, it's, uh, quickly is relative. I mean, in, in, the, in the face of the current situation, uh, we would, uh, like everybody in Austria is, is now trying to get uh, someone to rework the heating system <laughs> and replace <laughs> gas heatings, and you cannot. This is actually also a system dynamic thing. You don't have sufficient professional plumbers, for example, to do this right now. They're completely, yeah. they, you don't even get offerings anymore. That's, yeah. that's the main problem, I agree. And also for energy efficiency, for uh, like if you want someone, if you want a new insulator building, you don't get any offerings currently. This this is uh, so. The other hand, you know what I'm uh, I'm trying to uh, remove the gas uh, from Zagreb and replace it by district heating. And uh, uh, you have an incredible number of uh, very well educated uh, people in gas networks. Why not? Uh, uh, re-educated them. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, we need uh, like uh, a few weeks course for those people to be moved uh, away from the gas works and into the district heat again, uh, heat pumps uh, also. So, uh, but they're resisting. They don't want to do uh, green technologies. They only want to do black technologies. And I'm fighting uh, uh, the gas company because they want to keep the business model. Because you have really well educated people with lots of certificates, and for them it's very easy to move to uh, history heating. Yes. Yeah, I think this is. It's yeah. more political. Problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, Zagreb is a city owned by a uh, 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 gas company, which is on the direct link to Gazprom. Uh, and uh, uh, the gas mafia owns the city, so it's a bit uh, uh, difficult to uh, pursue it. And Vienna is a bit more uh, flexible in that direction. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm generally staying away from Slack. <laughs> but the problem in Vienna is even our, our CHP plants that produce the heat that we need, they are run with gas. Uh, so, yes, that's another issue, but they're much easier to convert to something else. Uh, because uh, uh, well, if, if they're cogeneration, then they're very efficient. But you can replace uh, gas cogeneration with heat pumps, like Stockholm. Stockholm is being heated uh, by heat pumps using uh, uh, waste water. Mm -hmm. So wastewater is used to heat stock. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have Daniel, and you could use Daniel to heat uh, Vienna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we even have a geothermal uh, reservoir underneath uh, Vienna, which okay. they are now exploiting, or want to exploit. Geothermal, yeah, like 80, 90 degrees. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So you can do geothermal. They, they you can do also solar. If uh, Danish can heat uh, uh, their small towns with uh, solar district heating, why can't we do it here in the south? This is actually a good. I, I also remember those examples from seasonal heat storage from Denmark, and I always ask myself, how is this happening in Denmark and not anywhere else where they actually have to heat much more? Where's someone from Denmark? Are you from? Didn't you bring the Danish example? I used to live in Denmark, but they are trying to really make everything more efficient. There's, 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 for example, this combined heating power plant that they have in Copenhagen, 
then I also want to include one page in storage on it. And I'm, I'm not an energy expert, but we want to combine it also with a deep one because, yeah, and it's really not in it, but, but basically, they, they, by the end of it, because you have a lot of waste heat for carbon capture and storage, they can dump even more waste into the program again. This heating system. Uh, I mean, Danish are the most advanced nation on uh, uh, new ideas, new concepts of uh, heating. Um, they are removing completely gas networks already for 20 years, and they're putting district uh, heating wherever it's possible, and they're using various options solar uh, uh, heat pumps, uh, uh, waste heat. Uh, they have quite a lot of industries. So, all work, for example, is heated uh, on waste heat from the cement plant. Uh, you have uh, more waste heat from industry than you need uh, heating. The problem is it's not always where the people are, uh, but you can decarbonize heating uh, easily. The problem are gas people lobbies. Uh, gas lobbies are pushing gas. Lobbies. Gas boilers are crime against the nature and humanity because they have no thermodynamical point. Uh, uh, they're senseless because they uh, destroy exergy in a huge amount. Environmentally and economically, does, uh, they don't make sense. Uh, but they're pushing them still. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because new ones are 30% more efficient, so replace your old gas boiler by a new one. Yeah, which works with the high heating right? wise it's a disaster. I don't know if anybody uh, is a mechanical engineer and understands yeah, the yeah, I know, I know. But if we burn the same gas in uh, CHP, uh, we can get two to four times more low temperature heating using district heating and heat pumps. Mm -hmm. Two to four times. Mm -hmm. So this is much better. If you need to burn gas, burn it in a CHP plant. Don't bring it to homes. And other thing, you're actually uh, polluting uh, cities by burning uh, gas and gas boilers. Come on, you, uh, there is no particles, so it's better than coal, but you still have NOx, uh, volatiles, uh, and all kinds of other, uh, other local pollutants. Mm -hmm. So let's remove the gas from uh, cities. I would totally, uh, there's no one who wouldn't agree with you today. But there were a lot of people disagreeing with you in Austria uh, before February this year. <laughs> before February, like before the, the, this, I mean, this changed everything. So now I think there's a certain content, but I think the danger is big. So that, uh, <clears throat> that now they're just replacing the source. The industry doesn't want to change their processes. I've been talking to bakeries, like industrial bakeries. They bake their bread with shots and ask them, Why can't you switch to electricity? I can, at my home, I can bake a bread with electricity, so why can't you? And, well, you can. and I'm working with this company since more than 10 years, and well, no, more than six years, and they, are, they always say, Oh, no, it's too difficult, you know, we need to change the recipe, and in fact, it was just cheaper for the last 20 years. It was it's very cheap. cheap. Yeah. Now, they're they're starting, oh, we have some oil problem, so we oh, can actually use Pyramon. But that works, all of a sudden it works. It's a question of price. Now we can make sure that this price signal kind of is sustained in a way that it uh, keeps the innovation potential, but, but small enough to not cause uh, energy poverty in a big scale. So it seems that uh, Putin is doing the greatest work for a uh, real agenda. He is uh, quickly degasifying Europe. Yeah. Once they hang him, we should bring him some red roses. Yeah. He is pretty much the best thing that the stress on the state gas but completely kills, also completely kills the narrative of a reliable energy source. So it is not, gas is not, cannot be seen as a reliable energy source anymore. We have here exactly in the case of scarcity that they huge prices and those investments on infrastructure make you really independent. You cannot really, 
that the whole concept of security of supply would tell you immediately that bringing uh, energy 4,000 kilometers away yeah. is not safe. And, it's, it's, it's and from not one source, it's, it's not yeah, safe. It's very, very unconvenient actually that yeah. one guy doesn't have to wait to decide I am able to hit my home. This and if you're going to survive this winter or not. So okay. anybody who was planning Europe in that way uh, was playing some foul game. So, um, yeah, looking at the watch tells me it's one o'clock, so I guess there's lunch somewhere, right, uh, Luca? So, I think we'll continue at two, right? Two is the usual time. Yes. So, we'll continue at two with a hands on venting session, and we'll, we'll continue at the in, in, in fairy tale land. So see you at in fairy tale land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
And you must be our letter from Bali. This part. Okay. Oh, this is only mining energy. Uh, 
Adding energy demand is the supply gap. The supply gap of wind is also increasing. But uh, I mean, I need those people. So, uh, demand. Getting out of the and and the gap signal should be triggering uh, uh, more expansion. Noise signal, expansion, emission, just expansion, and the emission up of the west is so. Because with delay, it should only be. This is the expansion. This is the This is the expansion delay. This is. Ah, because it's only um, the first part. Mm -hmm. Right? It's only the first part. But right. it's 1.5, and uh, it can only. Twenty-five years is delayed. Only after twenty-five years comes. But I want to. Okay, so I need to reduce this. What's the mission demand? Five. No, no, just three. This is really good. Um, Yeah, because we have to, I am we have to do two separate groups to the side of the road. The side of the road, the side of the road. Okay, but you said you didn't need a, you do need a demand. Yeah, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Actually, we can try not to take them away. Should I try to take them away? Yeah, no, I would like I'm fine with slave work. But of not including them here in the initial stock, but somewhere else, this is okay. Yeah, that's the way we can do it. Yeah, you don't take them away. Oh, it's possible to be to say to see the all the history of the beginning. In the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah, the beginnings of the history there were no guards. <laughs> so they all uh, it's like and it's also it's like this. Um so what is this is like in the yeah, the beginning. In the beginning, you don't need additional blocks in this because you have three, you have your blocks of line, right? Yeah. It's only when you have 150,000 in the Yeah, and the demand should increase, not the conservative. But the delay because of the stock, right? I was suggesting to work with the delay, the delay is. Yeah, so we put the time step to make this uh, value the include. Yeah, one third is moving out, so one one is looking at two. Mm -hmm. This is the time. This is the initial value. Uh, and you can just stay on the evening. Yes, model. No, it's not the model. No, no. Wait for the model. Save it. And now, save it. Okay. I'm going to do that right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, go. And, uh, go to the ranch. Mm -hmm. You get. Yeah, but then what's the energy consumption? We will just finish this briefly and then we need to send it around. Oh, okay. What's the energy demand? 
Let's just take this as a boundary condition issue. I would I would just finish the condition that you don't have this first drop. And so uh, there's no way there's already some issue here. No, no, no drop there because no mining. There's no mining. The mine is untouched. Okay, then we give her an initial capital of. Let's give her. Yeah, we have an investment. They have like they go. The business is actually some capital, no? So then. Well, we need to get it. Might be good. It's like what gives? What you need to take up? What gives? What you need to take up? Very little drops working. What? What? With too many drops working, that should be a three. Constantly a three. Oh no! Because I drop as a productivity of one volt on. How many volt? There's always a there's three and then we need like one point the, the higher yeah. three in the beginning and then then it's like one point five seconds. It's, it's interesting. Why does it need exactly at one point five? That in my case, shouldn't it go down to zero? Is it higher more? Maybe just like a five. Okay, so there's a time lag. You can you can do this with this. No, it's easier. Thanks, If you the budget for the user, then all five. So what would be this reducing? Like so how many new radios would be uh, Imagine. Yeah. If you have <laughs> <laughs> Like you hire them, but but, but then you fire them even a year before. <laughs> you like then you, you hire them, then you buy a fire machine, and then you're restraining yourself to not hiring them. So I think by this we leave we leave the we leave the work with the initial one like our boss is we learn and then we just work with the initial one and then we move and get our No, but it doesn't make sense. It's illegal. It's you're cheating. You're staying at the ropes. You're cheating the system. You know. There is no cheating the system. I think you know if if the girl if it just the initial drop three and I well then you need to explain it to the students then why they're slave drops. Right, there's a two class society, and you know, if you're coming from Norway, then it's more difficult to explain slave drops. I mean, you could come from Africa, fine, China, perfect, but Norway. <laughs> Leave me my nice slave drops, please. Yeah. <laughs> you took my dead drops also, so. <laughs> you had also, I ah, yeah, you were enslaving them and killing them at the same time, so you just yeah. paid them one time. It was even worse. I find that if I didn't pay him, I paid for them. If I didn't pay for them. But I mean, mine at least get a year's salary and they don't die. Like, so I'm, I'm just the three ones of a hard time. I mean, it's a fair concept, I was. Yeah, 
No, okay, we have um that's one no. Again, what's the energy consumption now? In the beginning, is it zero? It's 4.5, but that's good. Okay. And then it goes down, and then it's slowly Great. goes up again. Mm -hmm. goes down in the middle. Yeah. Okay. So for that time, and if it's not uh, okay. then we need to make it four of that. Like that. No, no, you will be taking a little focus on each to uh, reduce the time of the delay so you have nothing to do with the cost for the movement. Because you send four plus the demand and then send them to the shape. Because I mean, the moment that the lens is doing a day, it's a day. I mean, you can. The problem I understand is why is this action delayed? Why is this taking a kiss? I don't know which part is in our. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you can get it done and I go to bed. Good question. I have no idea. I think it is the first time ever. Did you say you did a new? You mean. Yes. Uh, rest lifetime. No, no, it's the rest lifetime, and this is 25 or so. It's very good. It's just like years is the lifetime. And I want to delay it by the lifetime. So we want to see what's happening in the lifetime. No, uh, it, because I have like the stock that I build up, and then I wait, then I reproduce it. I want to reproduce the exact same curve 25 years later, like when it has been built. 25 years later, I decommission it. So if there has been a lot of stock built 25 years ago, then I want to decommission a lot of stock today. Why don't you divide by use time? I mean, you can also just just. To do the definition you just uh, by the I mean, the idea is you know, sorry, this is not going to The idea was that if, if for example, there would be, let's say, P, yeah, yeah so you I understand the uh, And we want the flow, not the stop. Yeah, um, yes, because, uh, because the stop. I could also say uh, I, I, I keep commission one divided by a lifetime per year. Yeah. Uh, uh, see the stock thing? Oh, what's next? In June, the And there were a level that was and then there is the variable, right? That's the yeah. so expansion, yeah. The time is the lifetime. Which is zero. Is it because the delay is always a letter? Or? But, yeah, you are accumulating. The delay is a level. It's a little bit thin. So you are introducing. Mm -hmm. We are the accumulative uh, flow of the light. But why accumulate it? Because I want it, it, I want it as something that was very a level. I just want to have this signal, the same signal, at a later time. Delay 
conveyor. Maybe that's it, because this is you said there's this conveyor function in. Yeah, that's what you what can use in the lane. In flow is. Info is stock expansion. Where is that? Is that time? We could write. Hmm. Zero. This is the final. What is this? But why don't you work with the average that just average lifetime and then I could also do that as much better now? No. No, no, no. Yeah, let's do it like this. It's, it's changes. Let's let's do this. And when you want, like, so the reason why you would use it is because you want exactly that kind of machinery that is built, that exactly that machinery needs to go out from the like this. Yeah, in a way, without doing the link pitching. Yeah, I really think mean, that's easy. I understand the. That's very. And this is to the point like that. Und was ist das noch schwieriger zu machen? Oder wird das nicht sein, wenn man das passiert? Ja, das ist ein guter Punkt. Ja, das ist ein guter Punkt. Ja, das ist ein guter Punkt. Aber wir haben schon ein bisschen zu sagen. Okay. Und dann haben wir uns über positive Positionen. Natürlich ist es schick, die Position wird gemacht, aber okay. Aber das ist schon ein Glück, right? Ja. Und dann würde ich eigentlich das wollen, weil wir da auch die Energy Punkt haben müssen. Right. So, what is the energy, 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 energy demand? Mm -hmm. Like, you got this to? Yeah, you can send it to the and then uh, how is this the way? Yeah, yeah, that's good. 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 I mean, not the recycling. Yeah, so, I'm not necessarily in the recycling. So, recycling, I'm just going to go out. It was not necessary for it. Oh, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it is it is the end of the energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we don't have the supply gap and the basis. <laughs>